Good evening. Welcome to the Issues and Answers Forum. I'm Ron Milhorn, News Director at KMTS, and I'll be your moderator tonight. This event is brought to you courtesy of tonight's sponsors, the Glenwood Springs Chamber Resort Association, the Glenwood Springs Post Independence, and KMTS. Questions have been collected in advance and sorted to avoid duplication and to ensure that a wide variety of topics are addressed tonight. We will not be taking questions from the audience. The event is also being streamed on YouTube and the links to the recordings will be posted to postindependent.com, kmts.com, and glenwoodchamber.com. As the moderator, I will ask the questions of the candidates and issue representatives. Each candidate or issue representative will give a two minute opening statement. Questions will be asked in alternating order by last name. There will be a time limit of 90 seconds assigned for answering questions. The candidate that answers the question first will have the opportunity for a 30 second rebuttal. Each candidate will be allowed a two minute closing statement. Our timer tonight is Tara Harmon. She will hold up a card reminding tonight's speakers that they have 30 seconds left to answer a question. She will also let them know when their time is up. The order for tonight, we'll start with Colorado State, uh, Colorado Senate District 8 candidates participating remotely. Garfield County Clerk and Recorder candidates, Garfield County Treasurer candidates, Colorado House of Representatives, District 57 candidates, Glenwood Springs Ballot Issue 2C Accommodations Tax for Workforce Housing, and Garfield County Board of Commissioner, County Commissioners, District 1 candidates. All right, we'll begin with District 8 candidates who are also committed to uh, an event in Summit County. So we appreciate them joining us from Summit County via Zoom. We will start with Dylan Roberts, two minutes. All right, thank you everybody. And thank you for the accommodation to join you remotely. Sorry, I, I cannot be there in person, but both uh, Matt and I are over here in Summit County for another candidate forum uh, tonight. So it's great to be with you. Uh, and thank you to the Chamber, the Post Independent and KMTS for hosting this forum. Uh, my name is Dylan Roberts and I'm running to be uh, the state Senator for the new, newly redrawn Senate District 8, which includes portions of Garfield County. Um, I grew up in Steamboat Springs and live in Eagle County now uh, and have had the privilege of 
representing Eagle County and Route County in the State House of Representatives uh, since 2018, where we have worked uh, together to solve a lot of problems uh, that have faced the Western Slope. Uh, we've lowered the cost of health insurance by over 35% uh, on the Western Slope. I helped lead the largest investment in affordable housing that the state legislature has ever done in a single year this past year, which is going to result in millions of dollars going to places like Garfield County to help local development projects build more affordable workforce housing. I've worked with uh, the small business community, particularly in Garfield County, on business incentive programs like the Rural Jumpstart Program, which we worked very hard to ensure that Western Garfield County was able to become a Rural Jumpstart Zone, and several businesses in Garfield County have taken advantage of the Rural Jumpstart program. And I've worked with people like Representative Perry Will on our most precious resource, our water, and ensuring that we can promote conservation in Colorado while also standing up for our Western Slope water interests and protecting our farming and ranching community and everybody that relies on the Colorado River and its tributaries across the Western Slope. And every single bill that I just mentioned uh, were bipartisan. And I work very proudly across the aisle with Republicans and Democrats to solve problems for the Western Slope. And I would love to continue doing that as your state senator. We have more work to do. We need to take an active role in finding uh, solutions to our housing crisis to protect uh, our workforce and ensure that our nurses, our teachers, our police officers, and our tourism workforce can live in the communities where they work. We need to continue working to protect our water as we face drought and wildfire and out-of-state demands on our precious water. And we can do more to promote our rural small business economy from the state legislative level, working with local community leaders and small businesses to do that. Uh, I am committed to serving the Western Slope and being your your voice down at the Capitol. This Senate district is large and diverse uh, and deserves a senator who knows how to focus on results and get results for the Western Slope by working with anybody. If it's good for Garfield County, if it's good for Senate District 8, um, I will be focusing on solving problems for you. Thank you. All right, Republican challenger, Matt Solomon, two minutes. Can you all hear me now? Loud and clear. Did you mute, Dylan? Yeah. Okay, we're good. Hi, everybody. My name is Matt Solomon, and I join you right next to Dylan Roberts from right here in, in beautiful Summit County. We laughed that we were going to set our computers up like Battleship back in the day, and that way we could look at each other and have some fun while we do this debate. The new Senate District 8 covers most of Senator Rankin's old district stretching all the way from Gilpin and Clear Creek County to Jackson Grand Summit, Route Eagle, Moffett, and Garfield County comes into the picture north of I-70, north of the municipal boundaries. So it's a big district, larger than the state of Connecticut, if you can picture that land-wise, and I'm really excited to be here with you. I come to you with 21 years of experience in the public sector. As a paramedic, a deputy coroner, I still work with our U.S. military, and I was twice elected to Eagles Town Council. At the same time, I launched two companies internationally and two of my own in Eagle County, right next door to you in Garfield. That combination, that balanced perspective of public and private sector experience is what I bring to the table so that we can help jointly, collaboratively address the growth of government. A government in the last four years has grown by 25% a budget that's gone from $30 billion to $38 billion, a government that micromanages our day-to-day -day lives. And when the government has a fix on the price, on the product, and on the distribution of that product, we lose out on valuable innovation that helps us move forward with ideas for affordable housing, for energy, for all sorts of areas that impact our life. My ability and my perspective allows us to bridge gaps so that we can work together and collaborate towards solutions. We must put the people of this district before our party, and we have to work towards balance in our state. That starts with a balanced state legislature and works all the way down to balance at the county and town level. Finally, I want to get rid of the term the rural-urban divide. There are four things we can all agree on. 
people health, animal health, environmental health, and profitability. All of us agreeing on those four things is the first plank in the bridge between the rural and urban areas. And I look forward to being the person that walks across that bridge with you as I represent Senate District 8 for the next four years. I hope to earn your trust, your support, and your vote here in the next month. My name's Matt Solomon. Thank you. I need to ask uh, Dylan and Matt, can you see the, uh, the timer's signs? No. Okay. So I gave you a little leeway there. Uh, it was way over two minutes. Um, we'll see if we can rectify that. All right. First time question. Time you can time me if that works. First question, we'll start with Dylan. Or you want a time change? Yeah. All right, here we go. First question for Dylan. We know public lands and water are an important part of life and an economic driver for our region. What would you do to protect these natural resources? 90 seconds. So thank you for the question. Could you mute, mute, mute Matt? I got you. Uh, can you hit Matt? Oh, shoot. Thank you for the question. Uh, our public lands and our water are our most precious resource here on the Western Slope and I think for our entire state. And uh, we can and, and should do more to protect them. We uh, we all live here on the Western Slope because of our public lands and because of the opportunities that the outdoors give us and our, our economies depend on them. Uh, and we need to do more to protect our water. As I talked about earlier, our water is under continued and increased threat from front range interests and from out of state interests and also the threat of drought and wildfire that our communities face every single day. Uh, at the state level, we have done a great deal uh, to protect our water resources. I've worked on bills that have increased conservation programs to allow communities to ensure that their uh, rivers that are vital economic drivers continue to flow during dry summers. We've given support to farmers and ranchers to invest in, in water conservation on their own property. We set up a drought resiliency office within the Colorado Department of Agriculture to help with that work. And during my time in the legislature, we have invested an historic amount of funding into the Colorado Water Plan, which is a well-stakeholded guide for our whole state to determine what we need to do moving forward regarding storage, regarding conservation, regarding improved efficiencies. Moving forward, the legislature has a responsibility to put Colorado in the best position possible if the federal government decides to come in and enforce cuts on the Western Slope and on Colorado. We need to stand up for our farmers and ranchers. We need to do what we can to conserve more, but also show that Colorado is leading the way on conservation programs and that it's up to the lower basin states uh, to do their fair share with water conservation. Matt, same question. Water rights are absolutely <clears throat> one of the most important things in this district. We are the headwaters of the Colorado River and, and we are the start of the upper basin states in that compact. We need to hold the lower basin states accountable when the paperwork gets renegotiated here in the next couple of years. We need to set up our savings account inside our state boundaries so that we can protect what is ours. We also need to collaborate and work with the front range so that as they save water, they can help refill the Colorado River Basin from what they don't use. When it comes to wildland fires and the natural resources of our forest, we need to bring new technology in and stage it here in the Western Slope so that we can respond as quickly and work collaboratively towards preventative measures in our forests. We also need to work with our mineral rights, our oil and gas industries, which are huge in Garfield County, so that we can secure those and approve permits and work towards energy independence as well. Thank you. Dylan, 30 second rebuttal if you choose. So on the issue of wildfire, uh, we, need, we have done a great deal. You to unmute. Uh, thank you. So with uh, wildfire, uh, 
we have invested a great deal into wildfire prevention, uh, wildfire mitigation and response. And we need to continue doing that because the threat of wildfire uh, will continue to impact our communities for years to come. I've sponsored bills to increase our wildfire uh, detection uh, technology, including remote cameras and other uh, fire suppression ponds across our public lands uh, to make sure that our communities can respond as quickly as possible. And protecting our public lands from the threat of drought and wildfire will be a top priority. All right, we're giving you some leeway, of course, with these technological glitches. But believe me, there are certain, there's some, some forms in the past where I would have loved to have had a mute button. But that's, uh, we'll move on to question two. Matt Solomon, you get the, the first question. What do you think the legislature should do to help address the rising cost of housing statewide? Housing is a concern all across the district. There are three things that we need to address. One, we need a funding source that's sustainable in the long term, not just a one-time fund. We need a public-private partnership. Big Sky Montana has created a model that works towards public-private partnership. We need to learn from that and create one that works here in Colorado. And three, we need innovative solutions. We need to think forward, act now. And in doing so, we can create new ideas that will work. I apologize for the pause. The background noise got to me here. It, public private partnerships, those can include Habitat for Humanities group build. We can look at the low uh, income housing tax credits and figure out ways to be creative on the innovative side. And we have two brand new factories that are pre-building, making prefab homes and that they're making CNC homes right here in our district. And we can maximize partnerships with both of those businesses to manufacture affordable housing as well. So it's gonna take three things, economically sustainable long-term funding, public-private partnerships, and innovative solutions. Thank you. Dylan, 90 seconds. Thank you. So uh, increasing our supply of affordable housing uh, has been and will continue to be a top priority for me as a legislator, and I believe our legislature is working in a bipartisan way to address this. We know we face the crunch of increased housing prices most acutely here on the Western Slope, and our economy is struggling because of it, because we don't have enough housing for our workforce, for our teachers, our police officers, our nurses, and everybody that wants to live here. Uh, at the legislature, I've been proud to lead, as I mentioned, the largest investment we have made in affordable housing programs in a single year in our state's history. Those millions of dollars are going to flow to the Western Slope and uh, because I fought for an amendment that ensured that at least 50% of those funds go to rural and rural resort communities like Garfield County. That is going to catalyze public-private partnerships across the district and across the state um, who are will rely on that funding to jumpstart projects that are bringing in local governments, county governments, and private developers to build more workforce housing. We need to, moving forward, look at how do we address this issue long-term. That Those funds will be available for several years, but what can we do from a regulatory standpoint to reduce burdens that are getting in the way of affordable housing development? The state legislature should play a role in that. We also can incentivize more modular home building like we did in a bill that I co-sponsored this year called the Innovative Housing Incentive Program, which is going to help factories locate in Colorado to start building modular housing and increase the availability of our affordable housing stock in Colorado, including in Garfield County and Mesa County, which will help the whole region. Uh, housing is vital to our community health and to our economy. We need to continue focusing on this issue. Matt, 30 second rebuttal or response? I said in an earlier debate that Dylan and I were in that we should spend, it's a quote from General Mattis, 90% of our time identifying the problem, and then we can spend the other 5 to 10% of our time working the solution. And a big part of the problem that's created this housing crisis is our economy. The increased cost of energy, the cost of goods sold, that's increasing the cost of building and maintaining a home. A lot of the regulations coming down from the top are creating an increased cost of maintaining a home. Thank you. Next question. With the new legislative maps, uh, both of you alluded to the, the size and scope of uh, the newly redrawn Senate District 8. Um, Western Colorado in general is home to a broad range of political opinions. 
what would you do to best represent all residents of the entire district? Dylan. Thank you for this question. I think it's it's one of the most important uh, discussions we should have about how does uh, the next state senator represent uh, such a diverse district, both diverse economically, politically, geographically. Uh, I see this as a, a great opportunity. Um, there is so much more that we have in common in Senate District 8 than divides us. Uh, how I will do that is what I've done as a state representative. One of the things I'm most proud of during my time as a legislator is not any specific bill that I've passed, but that I've held over 60 town hall meetings during my time as a representative all across my district, from Gypsum to Hayden, from Vail to Steamboat, and everywhere uh, in between, including in the Roaring Fork Valley, in Basalt and Algebel, because I prioritize listening to my constituents, hearing their ideas, their concerns, and their challenges, and then bringing those down to the Capitol to uh, achieve results for them. Every single bill that I've uh, introduced myself has come directly from an idea from my district, from a constituent or from a group or from uh, community leaders that needed a problem solved. And I'm proud that every single bill that I've co-sponsored except for one has received bipartisan support. I'm much more interested in finding solutions that uh, help the people that live in my community. Uh, and I will do that by showing up listening to them and bringing their ideas down to the Capitol. As I mentioned, we have a lot of opportunity. Uh, there are ways that we can uh, generate and new economic activity and bolster our economies across Senate District 8 if we work together, find our common challenges, turn them into solutions together. Matt, 90 seconds. You know, Dylan hits the point of the head. We have to work together and we do have a diverse district that is huge. I've already driven 25,000 miles in the last six to seven months covering the district and listening to all of the points of views that I can. The first thing that's going to happen when I win the Senate, Senate seat is we are going to flip the Senate. That means we'll have a Republican majority in the Senate and a Democrat majority in the House. That alone brings balance to the state. And this divide I mentioned in the opening with the extreme right, the extreme left, it goes away because the super majority we have now, every bill has gone through on a party line vote. However, if we have a balanced legislature, now we have discussion and with discussion comes better bills because all points of view are discussed and the best ideas for our state come to the top. Secondly, in this district, I'm not gonna host town hall meetings in an echo chamber. I'm going to reach out to every party affiliation in the district and I'm going to meet with everyone at all times that I can and that people want to have discussion. We need to have discussions for expansion of knowledge, not conversations for conversion of points of view. And I look forward to facilitating that around the district. Dylan, your uh, rebuttal, 30 seconds. Uh, well, I'm, I'm much more interested in solving problems than, than any sort of political uh, majorities or, or solving or having partisan politics be uh, the, the top, uh, top of mind of any issue. Town hall meetings are a great opportunity to hear from every citizen. Some of the toughest conversations and most criticism I've received are from town hall meetings. They are definitely not an echo chamber. I also work very closely with Republican commissioners, uh, Republican local elected officials, people from all political persuasions uh, when I'm working on bills. I've worked with your commissioners in Garfield County on several issues. It's much more about solving the problems than any sort of uh, political ideology for me. Matt, what is the role of the state in addressing health care costs, especially for rural Coloradans? I'm sorry, could you repeat that question? Certainly. What is the role of the state in addressing health care costs, especially for rural Coloradans? Absolutely. The state needs to be the facilitator, and we need to help connect the dots to better policy. I don't feel the state should be the pinch point of the funnel dictating who can charge what and what can come in and be approved. Right now, what's happening is we have a balloon getting pinched at one end, while the other side of the balloon is growing. And that cost shifting, if we look at the Department of Insurance from last year's health option bill, is adding an average of 8.4 to 10%, as high as 33% on some policies in next year's projections. And that's a direct result of the state over-regulating and being too involved. Eagle County has a group that's trying to put together a local solution for healthcare, and they've been denied at every corner by regulations and a moving goalpost with every application they've submitted. 
and the state needs to be partners and facilitators in solutions. Thank you. Dylan, same question, 90 seconds. So I'll start by saying I believe every Coloradan and every uh, family deserves the security of, of affordable and quality health insurance. And it should be a goal to make sure that nobody fears seeking medical care because of the cost or fear of bankruptcy uh, because their family gets an illness or, or an accident happens. When I first took office in 2018, the number one issue I heard about from constituents on the Western Slope was the cost of health insurance, that it was too expensive, there were lack of choices, and people were going without health insurance because of the cost. In fact, our region has the highest uninsured rate in the state, and it's mostly because of the cost. And I think that's unacceptable. We've made some great strides uh, on this front, though. With the passage of the reinsurance program, which was co-sponsored by Senator Rankin, it was a bipartisan bill in 2019, we have lowered health insurance costs on the individual market on the Western Slope by 36%. That has decreased our uninsured rate significantly and ensured that people can have access to health care coverage no matter where they live. I was also proud to author the bill that made Colorado the first state in the nation to cap the cost of insulin for people with diabetes, which saves families thousands of dollars a month. We've also passed legislation to reduce the cost of other prescription drugs so that people can have access to the life-saving medication they need. And I was proud to sp sponsor and uh, get past the Colorado option, which coming online for sale next month will mean a new, more affordable health insurance choice for 63 out of Colorado's 64 counties on both the individual market and the small group market. So it's available to small business owners and their employees. We uh, need to do more. Health insurance is still too expensive. Everybody deserves the security of a safe and affordable plan. Matt, 30 second rebuttal. As I mentioned, according to the Department of Insurance, health insurance costs are going to rise across the board next year. And a big component of that is the health option plan that was pushed through last year. Ladies and gentlemen, when the government controls the product, the price and the distribution, there's no innovation and there's no room to account for the cost that goes into that supply. When we cap the cost and then the price of energy goes up, the cost of goods sold goes up, but with a government cap, the industries and the manufacturers are losing money, and we have to address that, meaning we need to get out of the business. I think I'm up. Dylan, what could the legislature do to help increase mental health care accessibility for rural communities? Uh, access to mental health care and our quality of, of mental health is particularly problematic here on the Western Slope. Uh, we need to do more from the state legislative level to ensure that anybody going through a crisis or anybody that has long term mental health care needs can get the support that they need in our communities. This past year at the legislature, we should be proud that in a bipartisan way, we invested uh, a significant amount of funding from the American Rescue Plan into mental health. We made that a priority with our federal dollars that we received, which is gonna result in a few things that are very beneficial for places like Garfield County and our region. More beds for mental health crisis on the Western Slope in our communities funding for more providers in our communities because you can't, if you don't have access to a provider, uh, you can't get the care that you need. Uh, and we have made reforms by creation of the Behavioral Health Administration that I think will hold these dollars that we spend more accountable so that the mistakes and uh, faults that have happened in some of our healthcare providers over the last few years, particularly on the Western Slope, don't happen again, or at least people can be held accountable when they do. Uh, we need to look, I believe, also uh, moving forward to try to break the stigma of mental health. And it starts with uh, making sure our kids and our, our communities know that it's okay to ask for help. That's why we passed the I Matter program from the state, which provides six free counseling sessions every year to Colorado youth. It has been used across the state in a huge way already, and the numbers are just increasing. If we can start breaking that stigma from an early age, we can solve a lot of our holistic mental health problems, but we should not stop until uh, the suicide rate in Western Colorado comes down and anybody who needs help is able to get it in their community. Matt, same question, 90 seconds. What we just heard is a series of very good plans and good ideas and good contributions to mental health. We've also heard a percentage of the 25% growth of our state government and where it's coming from. I sat down with an Air Force psychologist. She's a combat psychologist that works with vets and active duty members that have PTSD. And she and I spent I think two and a half hours discussing mental health and what we could do to really help it. And her first answer and the longest part of our discussion was we need to find more providers 
that can be available for people that need mental health. And after the 18 month shutdown of our economy, we have a whole segment of our population with emotional health issues. And we need to address that as well for what it is and not just lump it in as one of the same. And in order to get more providers, we need to find more resources, more hospitals to offer residency programs. We need to work on our higher education and open up opportunities for scholarship or grants so that we can get more mental health providers into the market. And we need to create and work with partnerships and facilitate hospitals, providers, community paramedic programs, whatever creative solutions we can come up with, we need to work around the table and make that happen. Thank you. Dylan, 30 second rebuttal. So uh, this is at mental health has to be a community driven solution, but the state legislature's role is to provide support. And so if funding uh, more uh, mental health beds or funding more providers is growing government, then I think that's a worthy part of growing government because we know we have a mental health problem. Uh, this is a, a life or death issue for a lot of people. And so investing our precious resources into mental health is a, a valuable investment that I think we can all get on board with. It should be driven by community solutions with local providers and with local local leaders, and the state should be a strong supporter of those efforts. Final question. Start with Matt. How do you think the legislature could work to improve education outcomes for Colorado's youth? Well, that's a question that's coming from around the district. And I'd have to ask real quick, if you don't mind, could you be more specific on what you mean by education outcomes? Uh, curriculum, the emphasis on basic subjects, um, it's pretty wide open. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to be clear because education is a very broad topic. And I do think the first thing we need to do is we need to stop borrowing from the education funds to finance other aspects of the general fund. It's called the budget stabilization factor. Senator Lundeen tried to push a bill through last year to do away with the budget stabilization factor and to put $700 million back into our school budget. Our education is constitutionally protected. Those funds that we send in tax dollars and otherwise need to stay with our schools so they can stay fully funded. Secondly, and in this district being direct uh, impacted by oil and gas, look at the town of Rangeley. And with the exodus of oil and gas, that industry financed their K through 12 and higher education programs. And with Chevron and Shell leaving the district, they are hurting. They have the same overhead, but they have less children are getting less money coming in. Finally, the READ Act that passed a couple of years ago, we need to get our children reading and help encourage them. And we do that by keeping funding in the schools. If we pay off para, we have excess money left over that we can give our teachers a raise and encourage them to stay engaged. And if their teachers are engaged, our students are engaged, we need to keep education as a priority in our budget at the state level. Thank you. Dylan, 90 seconds. So funding our public education system, our early childhood, K through 12 and higher education uh, needs to continue to be a top priority uh, from the state legislative level in, in our state budget. Uh, I agree that we need to buy down the budget stabilization factor as quickly as possible. This past legislative session in our state budget, we bought it down to the lowest level it's ever been in over a decade. And we are on a path to pay that down all the way to zero over the next one to two years, which is good progress. Uh, we But we need to make sure that we get it to zero and then we keep it at zero and don't continue to borrow uh, from other sources to fund uh, other needs needs in the general fund. Education should be a priority. But there are other ways we can improve education outcomes in our communities and across the state. It starts with increasing teacher pay and finding innovative solutions to fund that, whether through the general fund or other means. If we can attract more people to the teaching profession, uh, we know that our um, kids' education will improve. I also think that the state legislature needs to finally fix the school finance formula. Uh, for too long, uh, solutions have been tried, and for a variety of reasons, it never gets done. 
but the school finance formula is disproportionately impacting our rural school districts, and we need to fix that. And we can do that by working together. I think both Republicans and Democrats agree, but we need serious legislators who are willing to dig into that and finally come up with a solution to fix the school finance formula. And finally, attracting teachers and keeping people in the teaching profession starts with lowering the cost of living for teachers. We need to do more on workforce housing for our teachers specifically. There's been great partnerships with the Roaring Fork School District to build more housing, for example. We need to keep doing that and finding solutions for our teachers. Matt, rebuttal. You know, I, I, Dylan didn't rebuke me and I'm not gonna rebuke him. We both agree that education is a priority and we both present with you very similar ideas and suggestions. I'm gonna throw some icing on the cake and that is, sorry, Dylan. It, it, we need to stop with this growth of government and we need to meet our obligations first. If we keep PARA fully funded, that frees up $16,000 per teacher right there. If we stop with the overregulation and micromanagement of businesses and industries, that frees up money locally. All right, we come to closing statements and we'll start with Matt, two minutes. First of all, I really appreciate all of you hosting this, and I appreciate you going out of your way to facilitate Dylan and I being in another county and coming in remotely. It means a lot to us to be able to reach out to the people in Garfield County. It means a lot to me. Just to recap, our government has grown 25% in the last four years. I am here and I want to bridge gaps. I don't wanna recognize bipartisanship and enable the divide. I wanna get rid of the divide and represent our district fully, all of us, every one of us. I haven't asked a single person their party affiliation and I don't plan to start. Finally, four things we can agree on, animal health, people health, environmental health, and profitability. We can all agree on that. And I feel that I am the person that can collaborate and help us achieve all four of those things in sustainable ways. That is. Uh, that provides equity and listens and represents everyone fully. I, again, I appreciate your time. I appreciate your effort to get to know me through this process. And I remain available to all of you, whether it's through my website at solomonforcolorado.com or directly or in person. Again, have a good night. Thank you very much. Thanks. Dylan, two minutes. Thank you, and uh, I will echo the thanks of, of my colleague here for uh, your accommodations tonight to uh, allow us to join you virtually. Sorry we can't be there in person, uh, but we appreciate this opportunity to answer some questions and share our thoughts. Uh, you know, as I talked about, the new Senate District 8 is a large, uh, diverse district, and there are a lot of challenges that our communities face. Uh, some of those challenges are different depending on where you are, but I, I think we have uh, a lot of shared challenges, which means we also have a lot of shared opportunities. I think this district deserves a state senator who's willing to focus on uh, those challenges and knows how to find solutions to them. Uh, you deserve somebody who will go down to Denver and focus on the Western Slope and on Senate District 8 and not political parties or partisan talking points and, and, and ideologues. Uh, I've done that as a state representative uh, for Eagle County and Route County, which includes the Roaring Fork Valley right now. And we've achieved results uh, to help uh, on a lot of things. We've increased the availability of affordable housing funding. Uh, we've lowered health insurance costs significantly, capped the cost of prescription drugs, uh, and we've worked tirelessly on our, our most precious resources like our water and our public lands, which are so important to our region. Uh, but we have a lot more to do. We have more to do to promote our rural small business economy, uh, to protect our water from its increased demands, uh, and to ensure that you have somebody down at the Capitol who will protect your personal freedoms. Because state legislatures now, uh, as a result of the Supreme Court decision in uh, the summer, are the places where your personal freedoms are decided. Uh, and I will be a legislator that always listens to my constituents, tries to find common ground, even in such a large, diverse district, and will show up, listen to your challenges, answer your questions, and always work for results, not politics, down at the Capitol. It would be an honor to serve uh, part of Garfield County as the next state senator for Senate District 8. I encourage you to be in touch with me uh, if you have questions, and I'd be honored to earn your vote by November 8th this year. Thank you. Senate District 8 candidates, Dylan Roberts and Matt Solomon, thank you very much. This time we'd like to invite 
our Garfield County Clerk and Recorder candidates, Jackie Harmon and Becky Muller. Apparently earlier we had some uh, problems with the stream on Facebook and YouTube, but uh, apparently they're working well now. YouTube should be fixed shortly. Facebook stream is up and running. And if you're having trouble with either one, you can listen to KMTS on the radio or KMTS.com. All right. Two minute opening statements. We will begin with Jackie Harmon. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you everyone for coming tonight. We're almost filling up. Um, thank you, Angie, the Glenwood Chamber, KTF, KMTS, and the Post Independent for the invitation to speak tonight. I'm Jackie Harmon. I'm the Republican candidate for the Garfield County Clerk and Recorder position. I have lived in Garfield County for 30 years. I have raised my family here, and I'm proud to be a citizen of Garfield County and enjoy the many um, celebrations and events that we enjoy in this county. Um, in January, the current clerk and recorder, Jean Alvarico, announced her retirement. And while I'm excited and happy for her and her family, that opened an opportunity for me and my career in the office. I have worked for Garfield County for 21 years. I've been committed and dedicated to the office. I have been in leadership position for 11 years and I have extensive experience and office knowledge in the clerk and recorder's office. Um, I'm ready to lead and prepare to lead the office in 2023. I'm proud of the clerk and recorder's office. We provide many services to you, the citizens of Garfield County. We um, provide great customer service. We're a great team at this time, fully staffed, providing um, all the needs that are required of our office. We run great, safe elections. As a county clerk and recorder, I will ensure all these departments continue to operate with the highest customer service and integrity, with the confident, uh, um, with the confident and trained staff, with strong leadership, and advanced technology for the um, team and for the citizens and their needs. Thank you. Becky, two minutes. All right, thank you. Um, I'll echo Jackie's um, thanks for everybody for putting this together, KMTS, um, Post Independent, to Glenwood Chamber. Um, I am Becky Moeller. I have been in Garfield County since 2001, so 22 years. Um, I first moved to Carbondale and then kind of moved around up Valley a little bit and then bought my house in Carbondale in 07. Um, I am currently a contract paralegal. So I've been, I opened my own business seven years ago and, and have been providing contract paralegal work to attorneys throughout the Valley since 2015. Prior to that, I was a water law paralegal for 10 years at a water law firm. Um, I have been involved in community volunteer services for throughout my time in, Car in Car Carbondale and Colorado. Um, I have been on the Carbondale Parks and Rec Commission for 13 years. I was its chair for six or seven. Um, I am a volunteer for Five Point. I have been a volunteer for Five Point almost since its inception. Um, I am always the person in any office or any situation I go into that is always looking for how we improve things. I want to make sure that everything is running well, everything is moving forward, and that we're always improving. Um, throughout my career as a contract paralegal, that's what I do when I go to an attorney's office. I look at their policies, their procedures, and I figure out how can I do this better because every single day I have to prove my work to them or else they won't continue my service. I think that's it. Thank you. <laughs> All right, first question for Becky. Uh, why are you running for county clerk and what are your qualifications? You can go into more detail. <laughs> um, I am running for county clerk, honestly, because in February, I saw that nobody was running. And I figured with my legal experience, my experience as the um, Carbondale Parks and Rec Commission and as the chair for as many years as I was the chair. Um, also, I got my mediation certificate in 2019. So I have been the volunteer mediator for Garfield and Eagle County small claims and county courts since that time. I retained my MBA last year. So when nobody was stepping forward to run in February, I figured, well, now's my, now's my chance. 
Um, I have lots of qualifications for it. Um, and I figure I could, I could do the job as well as anybody else. Um, like I said in my opening statement, I'm used to going into offices and figuring out processes and figuring out how I can improve things. So I just figured my experience would work well in this position. Um, I have also applied to be the elections manager at Picking County, although I lost out to an actual attorney. And that was one of the reasons that led me to get my MBA, because I was like, I don't want to be an attorney, but I wanted to further my education. So I went and got my MBA last year. Um, and then also, I have been a municipal election judge for Carbondale for two election cycles. So I'm familiar with the elections process. And I've also, as a contract paralegal, dealt with special district elections. So um, throughout, you know, as a paralegal, I've done water rights and title researches. And I've also dealt with the elections department. And obviously, you know, whenever I go in and register my motor vehicle, I deal with the motor vehicle department. Jackie, same question, 90 seconds. Okay, why am I running and what are my qualifications? Well, I'm running for Garfield County Clerk and Recorder's Office because I've been there 21 years. I've been mainly stationed in the rifle branch. I've been the branch manager, office manager. I have a lot of experience in the office in each department. I have strong customer service skills. I work hard for the Garfield County citizens. I work hard to help them get the task done in our office. I'm proud of the clerk and recorder's office. I'm proud of the services we provide. I look forward to being a stronger um, representation in the Glenwood office. I've been in Glenwood uh, the past six months working as a motor vehicle manager, bridging my two offices, Rifle and Glenwood, to provide uh, stronger customer service, more, um, more uh, comparable uh, motor vehicle transactions. Um, and it's an exciting time as we prepare for a change in our office. A new clerk is coming. Um, that's exciting for everyone and what that looks like. And um, so I hope that with my experience and my customer service and my office knowledge, that I will be the next county clerk and will have, go forward in 2023. Becky, you have 30 seconds to respond or a rebuttal? <laughs> I, I, uh, yeah, I mean, um, I don't know that I really have anything else to say other than, you know, I have customer service skills too. Obviously I prove it every single time in my business. Um, I am an entrepreneur, I am an innovator. Um, you know, when I couldn't get it, you know, when I couldn't find something I wanted to do, I decided I was gonna step out and do my own thing. Um, and I will bring that to the office. I will bring out kind of innovation, entrepreneurship. How can we, have our staff have a problem solving and innovative idea. I want to make sure that we have um, people in the office that want to want to help people. Jackie, how would you seek to make the, the office run more efficiently and improve customer service? Um, that's a pretty exciting improving customer service. First of all, improving customer service is empowering the team and um, and giving them the tools they need to do the tasks, like improving customer service. Do we need to get motor vehicle kiosks throughout the county so people don't have to come into the office so that saves time for the uh, citizen? Do we need um, more uh, space um, available? Are we in the best space for motor vehicle for people to come in? Is the courthouse the best place? There's a lot to look at. How do I improve on customer service, um, team building, um, educating the team, making sure that um, we are well staffed so they're not stressed out or under the demands of day to day, which we currently are um, well staffed. We are pretty excited. We have a strong team at this time. Um, I kind of lost the question, <laughs> sorry. I went on customer service. Becky, efficiency and improving customer service. How would you go about that? Um, so I have been out talking to car dealerships and I have been informed by the um, clerk, the title clerks of the car dealerships that the statutory deadline for getting car titles done is currently not being met. Um, and so that, re that results in some people having to redo their car loan paperwork. Um, that would be one thing I would look into fixing you know, right away is how can we fix that? How can we get caught up on that? Um, and how can we keep us caught up with that over and over, you know, once we move on and get caught up. Um, I would also look at, you know, like Jackie said, 
you know, how do we increase the efficiency for motor vehicles? Let's get as many people as we can signing up through online rather than mailing in their stuff. Is there any way to send out our motor vehicle registration via email? Like we do, you know, for business registration, we all click the little button that says we want to be informed by email when our annual report is due. Let's do that with the motor vehicle registration so that we're getting paper and stamps taken off of our budget. Um, I would also look at providing deeds 24 seven so that we can, you know, have the person that's currently in the office that is responding to emails for deeds actually being able to do something that doesn't need to be, that, that a computer can do basically. Um, I want to find every single opportunity we can to have a computer do a job so that we can free up the staff to actually do jobs that can't be done by a computer. Jackie, 30 seconds response. Well, I'm really glad for the opportunity to visit a little bit about the dealership's concerns. The dealerships are our customers. We work hard for the dealerships too. When they bring their titles in, we focus on those and get their transactions done. Also, their customers are my customers. So when we are hearing that we're not meeting statutory demands, which there is not a statutory demand, there is a date stamp that we put on our title work and we're able to, um, that protects the redo of the title work. But we do, on an average, 2,000 titles a month in our office. Last question. Becky, how will you ensure a secure election process and avoid partisan influences? Well, like I said, I was an election judge for the municipal ones. I, I know what the processes are for that. Um, and I think what we need to do is educate people, you know, be out in the schools, be out in civic um, organizations, and just let people know what the processes are so that they understand. And if somebody comes up to them and says, you know, we're doing this, they can be like, well, that's not what I learned at so-and-so. And just really open the gate so that people feel that they can come to the clerk's office and to me to ask questions um, so that they understand what the process is. Um, also, I mean, we're doing a great job right now with the elections. I mean, we're the gold standard um, for how we handle things. You know, we have the paper ballots, we have then the election, the voting machines, which are never hooked up to the internet. And we just need to continue that. And we need to ensure that we're always aware of any threats to the elections and that we're always out talking to people and that we're always open and transparent with anything that is happening in the office as far as election goes. Um, we do have, you know, video monitoring of any election process um, that will obviously continue. That's a requirement. Um, and, and really just kind of, you know, I would just say education, 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 so that everybody understands what the process is and just get out there and let y'all know that if you have issues, please come to me if I am elected the county clerk, because I am definitely somebody that will, you know, look into things and figure out what's going on and, and let you know and let everybody know, because I do believe in open, openness and transparency in the government. I think it, it, it's imperative if we're going to have trust to have that. Just in time. Jackie, 90 seconds. Well, you know, we will agree on a lot. Elections are secure. Our office runs a fine election. I'm proud of that too. Um, again, I will agree with Becky. Education and communication. Talk to our citizens. Um, uh, I've been to many trainings on the elections and it's not a lot of reinventing the wheels with all this communication of unsecure elections in Colorado. We lead by fine example in the whole United States. Colorado elections are secure. They're bipartisan. It takes both neighbors to come in and run our elections. It takes two people from both parties to come together to grab the ballots, open the ballots. Um, and and it, takes a, it takes neighbors. And I've been proud to see that year after year in the 21 years. And that has not changed, even with the bad publicity or the comments that we're getting. We're neighbors, we run our elections together and um, we run secure elections. Um, coming up in 2024, we're gonna face a lot more um, challenges and a lot more um, ideas that we'll have to implement and take a look at. And I look forward to that as the county clerk because I want you to be confident in your elections. I want you as the citizens of Garfield County to be confident and be educated on what we're doing in the clerk and recorder's office. Becky, 30 seconds. 
All right. Um, I mean, I obviously echoing what Jackie says, you know, just make sure that we have education out there. Um, I had a thought and it, it obviously just went away. So, you know, <laughs> I think that's good. I think we hit the nail on the head. Um, you know, elections are secure. We need to keep it that way. And we need to make sure that we are on guard so that we are always having secure elections and always con 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 talking with people. And my thought was the election judge. Yes, we, our election judges are incredible. I mean, a lot of them have been there for a long time. I'll let you take a drink. What's that? Oh, I'll let you oh, take no, a drink. Is it? Oh, okay. Well, I don't really need it, I guess. <laughs> All right, two minute closing statement. All right, well, it doesn't appear that there's a lot of difference between Jackie and I. Um, I would say maybe the main difference is the fact that, you know, I've gotten my MBA, I've run my own business. I, I take control and I take charge and I like to go out and figure things out. Um, I, I feel that, you know, there has been somebody coming up from the office since 1978. It might be some time to get some new eyes in the office to see, you know, how can we do this? Somebody from outside the office to say, what exactly are we doing? Does this make sense? To listen to the people that are in there that really have the experience and, and can come to me and say, hey, maybe we should be doing it this way. Maybe we should be doing it that way. Um, you know, I got my MBA in entrepreneurship and innovation, and that's what I want to bring here. I want to make sure we can find out how can we make our office more efficient, more innovative, so that we are meeting the needs of our constituents um, and so that we are you know, doing everything we can to serve you because that's really what this office is for. How much time do I have left? One minute. Oh, really? Wow, okay. What? <laughs> I felt like I was going on forever there. Um, you know, just really, I think, I think the main difference between us is I haven't been in the office and it's really up to you. Do you want some new eyes in there? Do you want kind of somebody coming up through the office? I've always kind of thought that it should be somebody in the office, but now I'm like, well, maybe we do need, I didn't realize that it was Mildred and then Jean. And now if Jackie comes in, she'll have 20 years. So maybe it is time for some new eyes in there. And I really do look forward to being your clerk and recorder coming up in 2023. I hope I can count on your vote in November. Jackie, two minutes. Okay. Well, first of all, Becky has challenged me. She has made me rise to the occasion to running for county clerk. Um, I have extensive experience in office knowledge for 21 years. I am proud of that. I've been committed to the clerk and recorder's office. Um, it is a fun office. It's the office you come in to get your FIDO records, the birth certificate, the first time you register your car. It's the first time registering to vote. Um, it's been, I've been a part of a lot of the citizens' lives in Garfield County, and I've built confidence and trust from a lot of the citizens of Garfield County. In my time at the office, I've built relationships with counties abroad. I've built relationships with the state of Colorado, and I've built relationships within the county. So this prepares me to step into the office and get things started. I'm not Jean. I am proud of Jean, and I am going to be Jackie Harmon, the Garfield County Clerk and Recorder. I bring um, ideas. I bring some ideas to remodel. I bring some ideas to brighten the Glenwood office. Um, we have a great team. I want to build on that. I want to empower them. We have a strong elections team. I'm really excited to work alongside them. And we have a lot to prepare, in my opinion, for the 2024 election. And I'm ready for that. I'm ready to come alongside and uh, do that. Um, I will lead the le office with the highest level of customer service and integrity above and beyond as a public servant to you. My relationships with the community can speak of the person I am and who I represent. Um, Garfield County citizens should vote for me with confidence. Um, I would be honored to have your vote November 8th and your support has been so great every day. Thank you. Garfield County Clerk and Recorder candidates, Becky Muller and Jackie Harmon. Thank you very much. This time I'd like to invite our Garfield County Treasurer candidates, Gary Cooey and Aaron Diaz.
All right, so we'll begin with Carrie, two-minute opening statements. Yes, hello. I'd like to, first of all, say thank you to the Glenwood Chamber at the Glenwood Post Independent and KMTS for putting this together. Uh, it's a valuable thing for us to be able to talk to the community about why we're running for office and why we'd like to represent them. First of all, just to give you a little bit of a biography about myself, I am, I've lived in Garfield County since 1989. Um, I'm a fifth generation um, Western Coloradan, and um, my husband and I live on a family-owned cattle ranch south of Silt. We've raised six children. I have um, a great deal of experience in, um, in a large retail management situation where I did cash management and managed human resources. I've also been in the construction industry where I have managed those budgets and um, done estimating and proposals for those um, for that company. Um, my education is um, a bachelor's in accounting and business management. I also have a bachelor's in organizational leadership and a master's in organizational leadership with a specialization in public and nonprofit management. My husband and I run a nonprofit for veterans where we provide services to those with PTSD and, um, and other issues there. And I've had some amazing accomplishments in the last two and a half years in office. Um, I'm hoping we'll be able to expand on that more in this discussion. Um, and I really appreciate you guys taking your time to watch us tonight. I'm, I'm hoping that we'll get a chance to display the differences between us and I'd like to demonstrate to you how I may be the better choice here um, because of the two and a half years of experience and the successes we've had there. I really appreciate it. Aaron, two minutes. Uh, thanks, Ron. Um, thank you to the Glenwood Chamber, the Glenwood Post Independent, KMTS Radio. Um, <clears throat> it's great to have this opportunity to talk with all of you here tonight and everybody uh, at home Hopefully we have a, a decent sized audience to hear what's, uh, what the differences are between me and my opponent. I uh, am a fourth generation Garfield County resident. My son, who's a senior at Rifle High School, he's our fifth generation. When I graduated from Rifle High School nearly 30 years ago is when I started my career and my passion in public service. I went uh, to the University of Colorado and I served as a legislative aide in Representative Russell George's office in the Colorado House of Representatives. From there, I, I moved my way up, different campaigns, did other things, worked in Senator Wayne Allen's office out in Washington, DC, um, also in Congressman Bob Shaver's office and in the uh, office of uh, Governor Bill Owens in workforce development. And you might say, well, wow, that's a lot of Republicans. It's like, yeah, because I used to be a Republican. And then I changed parties, but I've done a lot of other things along the way too. Came back, worked as uh, the Associated Governments of Northwest Colorado Executive Director here and uh, served the counties and municipalities in this area on energy impact issues. Then I moved on and worked on sustainability uh, issues as the municipal rep for waste management. And then I also uh, ran for and won a seat on the SILT trustee board. I've uh, been working with the Democratic Party for uh, the last two years. And I also went back and got my master's in public administration a couple of years ago too. I'm excited to talk more about my plans for the treasurer's office and thank you all for uh, being here tonight. First question for Aaron. You can go into detail now. Why are you running for county treasurer and what are your specific qualifications for the office? Well, I think through uh, my, my bio there, I kind of showed you my, my qualifications. I have nearly 30 years of experience in public policy uh, uh, issues and, and work uh, in both the public and private sector. Uh, I have a, my master's in public administration. This is an administrative office. I mean, we, they do hire uh, you know, accounting, accounting uh, accountants. Uh, so that's what we have there. As far as what my plans are for this office, I believe that my opponent was appointed in a partisan fashion. I disagreed with that. That was the first point when I, when I was asked to come and, and run for this office. That's the first thing I found out about. But as I pulled that thread a little bit more, I realized we need to increase transparency in this office. A lot of people don't know what the treasurer's office does. We need to make sure that every voter knows exactly what the office does, why it's doing it, in a way that you can digest it and understand. I want to increase 
uh, the transparency. I want to improve the customer service experience for all residents, and I want to implement best management practices. This is an approach that is not just uh, uh, innovative, I guess, for, for our times today, but it's an approach that has garnered me the endorsement of the past two elected Garfield County treasurers, Democrat Georgia Chamberlain and Republican Carla Bagley. And I'm very proud to have their support in my uh, efforts to seek this office. Gary, 90 seconds. Yes. Um, the reason I am running for election is because the past two and a half years, we've had a transition and I've learned a new role and it has gone very well. I've had some accomplishments. I've collected $5.8 million in delinquent property taxes, the largest bankruptcy in Garfield County history. I have managed the office during the largest amount of releases of deeds of trust as far back as we can go in history. I've had the two highest collection percentage years and um, we've managed to do that with excellent customer service in the office among challenges, including COVID-19 and the transition from an abruptly leaving previous treasure. We've managed to bridge those gaps, create a new team and um, the teamwork has been very fantastic. We have highly competent people, although they haven't been there very long. And um, I've helped put that together. Of course, my team gets the credit as well, but I would like to continue more of the same of that and improve upon that so that we can continue to serve the Garfield County constituents without an interruption in service and, a, and without the instability that a change will cause. Aaron, 30 second rebuttal. Uh, first, I would like to say that, that the, um, the continuity of service thing I, I think is is not even a, a problem. I have this, like I said before, I have the support of the past 30 years of, of knowledge in that office. These are women who have run for election and re-election nine times and been uh, supported by the people of Garfield County. Some of the things that Carrie just mentioned as accomplishments, especially the $5.8 million in, in tax collections, I think that's more of an occurrence and not an accomplishment. We'll get into that later because I'm gonna observe the rules and that's my time. Next question with Carrie. In what ways would you seek to improve the way the office functions and improve customer service? Yeah, uh, we are already working on improving customer service, but that's something we've continued to do the entire time. Uh, we had a, a very lean staff when I started there, um, and we have added another position to that. Hopefully, we'll be able to fill that soon. Um, it's been operating in a very lean manner for a very long time, and it was time to be able to offer something better. We have, um, we have um, managed to to um, add some new services. We have moved to online only releases of deeds of trust um, for qualified holders. We have moved to online foreclosures, which will reduce the occurrence of bid rigging um, where, where there are illegal activities going on in the courthouse, which will reduce the obligation of the county to deal with that. We are also moving to um, online foreclosure, I mean, online, um, um, abilities to pay your taxes and to receive a text to pay your bill, um, including new payment options such as Google Pay and Apple Pay. And the innovation is all in the works right now. Aaron, same question, 90 seconds. I think everything that I want to do is about customer service. Increasing the transparency will allow you to know objectively what the office is doing, why and how it's doing it on your behalf. Uh, in, and then implementing best management practices, helping the staff be putting positions where they can uh, be empowered, where they can be put in a position to succeed or something that, that we need to do. I mean, as a workforce all across, you know, Garfield County, people understand the changing nature of work and we need to adapt to those changes before they hit us at a governmental administrative level. Uh, we need to know exactly what's happening in this office from top to bottom. And you need to know that you're getting exactly what it is that you deserve from your elected officials. And that is exactly what, how I'm an administrator of that office. And that's why the difference is 
when she talks about it, uh, collecting $5.8 million, that's something that was already built into the uh, bankruptcy proceedings for URSA. That was money where they listed Garfield County as the number one creditor. We were going to get that money. It was an occurrence. It wasn't an achievement. And you will know the difference when I'm your treasurer. Gary, 30-second rebuttal. So there is an amount of process that goes into that bankruptcy procedure, and you do have to make sure that you don't damage the relationships in the process. Yes, the money is built into it, but you still have to deal with the new company, and you have to foster those relationships with the new company. But you're forgetting that's not the only accomplishment we've had in the, that amount of time. And we've managed to run things without a hitch in the last two and a half years. A very good, seamless transition without any major hiccups, without any major news stories. Last question, Aaron, should the treasurer's office be a partisan one? Why or why not? Absolutely not. I think that there are certain offices in all of my years of public policy work in, in various offices, there are policies that you are driving from a partisan point of view. And there are certain offices administratively, especially in this county, clerk, room, recorder, treasurer, assessor, sheriff. These are things that should not be partisan. Uh, they happen to be in under our current structure, but I have worked with both sides. I like to, you know, paraphrase, paraphrase Jimmy Buffett about, you know, I've, I've you know, read a dozen of books about heroes and crooks, but you know, I've worked with, with both sides, right? Learned much, much from both of their styles, both Democrats and Republicans, and I can work with both. And we are going to have an office that serves you fully when I'm treasurer. Gary, 90 seconds. When I come into the office during the day, I don't think about the taxpayers and our customers as if they're a Republican or a Democrat or an unaffiliated person. I look at them like they're part of the community and that there's a service that I need to provide to them and I need to provide to them the very best service I can. I treat them as individuals and as members of, of our community that deserve respect, that deserve every bit of good service that deserve the top level there. And I treat everyone the same. Yes, I am a Republican. I have never treated my office as a partisan, as in a partisan way at all. I've been very fair, very neutral. And um, I, I don't believe that, that I have ever had any partisan thoughts in the office whatsoever. Aaron, rebuttal, 30 seconds. That's, that's hard to say. I mean, I, I do uh, personally like Carrie, but I think that it, this is not a, a critique of her. I applaud her for trying to step up and serve the people. And I just think that this is one that is real more of a criticism on the way that the commissioners, I feel, injected uh, partisanship into it when they took somebody who had zero public policy experience at any level and, and said, you know, we're going to take our our. Garfield County Republican chair and make her the next treasurer. All right, closing statements, Aaron, two minutes. Uh, once again, I want to thank everybody for uh, listening online and here and uh, the Columbia Chamber, Post Independent, KMTS, and, and, and you, Ron, thank you so much for your work tonight. You know, I was thinking about this, uh, this line and uh, you know, I heard a guy once say, not just some guy, say that sometimes you sit there and you have Ritz crackers. You think you have Ritz crackers. And then after a long time, you realize you've just been getting saltines. And I think a lot of our politicians sit around and hope that you either don't care or don't know the difference between the two. What becomes tragic is when our public officials either don't know or don't care about the difference. I know the difference. I know the difference between an accomplishment and an occurrence. And when I'm your treasurer, I will let you know exactly what's going on. I'll call my shot. I'll let you know up front, transparently, all that's happening in that office, why it's being happened on your behalf, and what, uh, what, is, what the thought process went into so that you know, so you can evaluate me. You know, I read a, read a letter to the editor today that talked about accountability. 
And I believe in accountability and elections are an opportunity for us to have accountability for our public officials. I'm asking you under all of, of, of my experience that I have had from the federal, state and local levels, experience and a plan that our past two treasurers have endorsed. I think you understand the difference uh, between our, our skill set. I know that our, our past treasurers do, and I humbly and respectfully ask for your vote this fall. Thank you very much. Gary, two minutes. Yeah, I want to thank you all for taking the time out of your um, evening and, and listening to these. It's very important to have some civic participation. Um, I just wanted to tell you all, um, thank you for the support that I've had for the last two and a half years. I've had a lot of um, people come in and tell me that they like the way things are going, that they like the way my office treats them. I've had a lot of thank yous that way. The other thing I wanted to point out is that when I was appointed, it was because the previous treasurer left midterm and left in a hurry. And this is one of the treasurers that um, has endorsed my opponent. It left a big gap in that office and it left employees who felt like they didn't have a leader. And I bridged that gap. And I think that may be my most important accomplishment there. Um, it's, it's hard to go on when you don't know who, where, what your next steps are gonna be and, and you don't have a sense of direction. I provided that to the office. Um, in addition, I will continue to strive to be better. I know things aren't perfect. I know that I will continue to improve and I will always look for the better because I've already done it. I really ask for your support in this. Now is not the time to have the instability of a change. We have had a really good two and a half year run. The employees are happy right now. We are able to keep things going the way they are and improve as we go. So I would really appreciate your support in continuing that. Terry Cooley and Aaron Diaz are Garfield County Treasurer candidates. Thank you. This time, we'd like to invite our candidates for Colorado House District 57, Elizabeth Velasco and Harry Will. Welcome. We'll begin with uh, two minute opening statements, Elizabeth. Thank you. Um, hi everyone, I'm Elizabeth Velasco. I'm running for House District 57 as the Democratic candidate. And I want to say thank you so much to our host. Thank you so much uh, to everyone who's here taking the time to hear my, my vision for Western Colorado. I am a small business owner and a wildland firefighter and I have been serving the community for 20 years from you know, doing public information during the Grizzly Creek fire to volunteering at the food distribution centers during COVID and also serving, um, working with the courts, the hospitals, nonprofits and school districts offering language access because we are a diverse community and a di diverse district. And I am here today to ask for your vote ask for your support, ask for your treasure. I am a, a working family uh, candidate. I am a grassroots candidate, and I am the only woman <laughs> in this race. And I really care about our communities having access to healthcare, to clean air, to clean water, to reproductive rights, to a quality education, no matter where we live, no matter our zip code. So I really want to, to ask for your support again. Uh, and you know, I know that we are stronger together. Very two minutes. Thank you. And thanks for the opportunity. I, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to speak here tonight. And uh, you know, I have to say, I love representing House District 57. 
I love the people in this district. I love everything about it. I'm a longtime resident of this valley. I know the country. I know the rivers. I know the creeks. I know the mountains. And I know uh, most of the people, or a whole lot of them. And uh, it's uh, it's been the biggest honor of, of uh, my life, actually, to uh, serve for four years over in the, in the Colorado legislature. And I, I want to say, you know, it's been said tonight before, but I had over 40 years in public service with the state. And I see the my uh, public service, this is an extension of my public service uh, at the House, House of Representatives. And, uh, you know, I, I uh, it's been said, but I, I don't just represent Republicans, Democrats, or independents. I represent everyone over there. And I will tell you that uh, you can look it up in Colorado politics, but I was uh, I voted the most bipartisan legislator this session over there, and I, I run a, a I run a lot of bills. I had thirty three last year, and uh, you know my, I have to tell you that my moral compass does point north. I'll always conduct myself as a gentleman. I'll never embarrass anyone from House District fifty seven on that House floor. I have too much respect for the institution over there, and. Uh, you know, I uh, <clears throat> I run a lot of bills on healthcare, behavioral health. I do a lot of stuff for our natural resources, wildfire, uh, for wildlife. I'm on multiple committees. I'm on capital development committee, wildfire matters committee, ag livestock and water, energy and environment, uh, pension review, house services, to name a few of the uh, committees they put me on over there. I want to say that. Uh, I don't keep track of statistics, but uh, last year in the session that uh, on my bills, if I was a sponsor on the bill, had a six time, six times a chance of passing if my name was on the bill. So I am bipartisan and work across the aisle. Thank you. First question, we begin with Perry. Um, we know public lands and water are a critical part of life and the economy for the region. What would you do to protect these natural resources? 90 seconds. That's, that's been my lifelong career, uh, protecting those exact resources. I have to tell you, I represent all the reasons people in this room choose to live here. And that means healthy forests. That means water, right? That means wildlife, all of our natural resources. I represent all those things. I've done it as a career. And I'll continue to do that. Ask anyone to legislature. I stand up for that stuff. And they know that. I run a lot of bills. That, uh, I ran species, since the species bill last year, uh, non-game conservation bill, anything to do with natural resources and that I'm there. I'm on the Wildfire Matters Committee, which we do a lot of bills on uh, forest health and uh, forest management. I say all the time, when you tie in water with forests, there's no better reservoir, there's not a better reservoir than a healthy forest. You can build dams, but the best dam you can build is have a healthy forest. Elizabeth, what would you do to protect these natural resources, the land and water? Yeah, I know that for our community, our public lands are number one priority. I have been talking to people from Parachute all the way to Aspen, and this is something that matters to all of us, to Republicans and affiliated and Democrats. And as a wildland firefighter, I've been on the trench lines, on the fire line, uh, making sure that everyone is safe. And I know that in our district, 60% of our geography is public lands. So that's a huge, um, a, it's a huge treasure that we have. And we know that we depend on our natural resources for recreation, for conservation, uh, and also for our health. And last year, I testified for a bill do, uh, were, they were doing more air monitoring because last year we had a day in uh, where we had the worst air quality in the world here in our community. And that was because of compounding effects of smoke. So I know that there's so much that we have to do to have a resilient community. So I look forward to bringing that to the legislature and representing our communities well and working with everyone because we all depend on our natural resources and always putting Western Colorado first because we are, you know, as a state doing our part and we have to hold the other states accountable like California and Arizona. And also we don't want any diversions of our water to the urban areas. 
So I know that this is a huge issue for us. All right, 30 second response. Yeah, so, I mean, I'm a conservationist, not a preservationist. And that's what we've done with our forest in the last hundred years. Uh, we've been in the preservation mode. That's why we have these mega fires. Yeah, there's the climate change. There's the, uh, you know, the drought situation we've been in. But, you know, these mega fires, are, you know, beetle kill, those type of things that could have been managed if we had uh, good forest management. And that takes money. It takes a workforce. It takes a workforce we don't have. I'm running a bill this year on workforce for getting people into the timber industry and getting our youth involved in it and uh, encouraged by it. Elizabeth, what uh, do you think lawmakers, state lawmakers should do to help address the rising cost of housing statewide? Yeah, I can tell you growing up, my parents were working three jobs to be able to afford to live here, to be able to afford to pay rent. And that's something that our families are going through now. And as a working class candidate and uh, a champion for working class families, I look forward to bringing innovative solutions to the legislature, um, you know, from supporting uh, people so that they're able to, to get a loan to buy a house and supporting municipalities so that they can work on their own affordable housing uh, projects and making sure that we um, are supporting mobile home owners to buy up their land and they're able to invest back in their homes. And I also saw that when our housing is tied to our employment, that was a huge issue where my, my parents were actually uplifted from their home of 10 years because their employment changed. So these are things that we always have to put into account is that we don't want to leave anyone behind. And I will always put our working families first. Very same question, 90 seconds. Thank you. The how, affordable housing is tough. And, you know, you can't wave a, wand, a magic wand and, and solve it. You can't. So there's, I think there's some federal funding uh, available that we need to pressure for federal funding for some of our affordable housing. There's, uh, I've ran uh, multiple bills. Actually, uh, um, Dylan Roberts is in the house. I ran two affordable housing bills with him, uh, one two years ago and one this year, uh, we got the revolving loan fund. So the, he, he said, that, you know, it's, it's bipartisan and we work together over there to try to solve these. Part of what we morphed into is if, you know, if you look at the state of Colorado, we're at what, about 6 million people now in this state. And then you look in the Roaring Fork Valley in this area, we've, uh, you know, we, our economy's turned from to, into tourism right, tourism and recreation away, away from ag and the natural resources that it used to be uh, several years ago. And so that, that's also a problem because that's uh, uh, increased housing costs. As you all know, anyone sitting in this room know what the housing costs have done. But there are some innovative ways we can go about it. There's, uh, you know, there's been stuff talked about even uh, using TABOR funds as uh, some kickstart money. Um, I don't necessarily agree with that. I don't, but there's a lot of different ways we can look at it. Uh, we even uh, run a bill um, two years ago where the uh, unclaimed property money could be used to help in affordable housing. So uh, top, top of mind and uh, definitely working on it every day over there. Elizabeth, 30 second rebuttal. Yeah, I think that we, we are ready for new leadership. We are ready for new solutions. This is a, a, an opportunity for us to to bring in new new ideas to the legislature. So I look forward to um, representing you proudly at the legislature and I hope to have your vote. Next question, Perry. District 57 is diverse and home to a broad range of political opinions. What would you do, what would uh, you do to best represent all residents of the entire district? Thank you. I'm I'm a good listener. I listen to everyone, and uh, I don't I don't ask you if you're Republican, Democrat, or Independent. I don't care. I want I want to hear what your issues are, what we can do to sol solve them. Um, you know, we we can run bills. Sometimes it helps. I just run a bill. It doesn't help Democrat or Republican or whatever. I run bills to help the people of the state of the, of Colorado, and I, I, I you can look at my track record. Those are the kind of bills I've ran. And if it helps Colorado, 
There was one particular bill this year. I, I was the only Republican in the House to vote for, but it helped people in House District 57, so I voted for it. So uh, I got broad shoulders. Uh, I don't I don't cave to any caucus uh, pressure. Back when I first went over there, I met with the caucus, uh, the uh, minority leader, and I said, I'm going to vote my my conscience, you know, my constituents, and maybe the caucus. And that's how I do it. Elizabeth, the, um, how would you represent a, a, a broad range of political opinions and perspectives in District 57? Yeah, you know, when, when I'm deployed out to fire, I don't ask people, are you a Democrat? Are you a Republican? Are you unaffiliated? I make sure that everyone is safe and I make sure that people have the tools and the information that is timely and that is factual to make sure that they're safe. And that's something that I'm gonna bring with me uh, to the legislature. And I will always put our district first. I will put House District 57 first before anything, before um, any party lines, before anything, because I know that solutions um, that work for urban areas don't always work for us. So I look forward to being that strong voice and a strong champion for our working families here in the community. And, you know, I look forward to working together. Uh, I've worked with federal agencies, local agencies. I've worked with our sheriff's offices from the three counties, from Pitkin, Garfield, and Eagle. And I know that when we work together, we, we come up with better solutions. So I look forward to having that input from our community. And I am also, you know, going where people are. I am door knocking. Uh, I am phone banking and, and I am having really good conversations, those one-on-one -on -one conversations um, so that people know that I'm listening, so people know that they're engaged and I want to bring those community-led solutions to the Capitol. Perry, 30 seconds. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's easy to say and hard to do sometimes, especially when it comes, when it comes to the caucus. Uh, I've witnessed it, I've witnessed it for four years but you know we do have to work together, and I I asked I asked my opponent Elizabeth at, at Club Twenty. I said, "You, we promised me to be the as bipartisan as I am if you get over there." And I can tell you, um, I've I've not seen that from from the other caucus. I'm not uh, I'm not saying that you wouldn't, but I I have to say I've not seen that. And so that's what we need people representing this district. Is that's going to work for the people. It's about people, it's not about party. People before party. Elizabeth, what is the role of the state in addressing healthcare costs, especially for rural Coloradans? I see that the role of the state, uh, you know, really is about removing barriers of access so that people have um, those opportunities uh, to be able to get good healthcare. And I know that right now, Healthcare looks like going to the emergency room when something's wrong. You know, we are not doing that preventative work because people can't afford it. Um, so I look forward to working on that. And I know that even the teachers and even our, our working families, even when they have the insurance from their work, they're not able to afford it. Um, so we need to keep bringing the prices of healthcare down. We need to invest in education and training to have more providers. We need to work together with our community clinics so that they can offer more, they have more offerings. And also thinking of innovative solutions and bringing in those nonprofits and those private partners to work together because we know that, um, you know, even a peer support group can be very powerful, uh, especially when it comes to healthcare for students and for young people in the community. So I know that uh, healthcare is a huge issue for us here in the community. We have some of the most expensive cost of healthcare in the state. And I am gonna go to Denver to put our district first and fight against those special interests because we see that the special interests are making more and more money and our community needs that access. All right, healthcare, 90 seconds. Yeah, thank you. I I ran uh, actually last year four, four bills on trying to drive down the cost of health care. If you look around the counties, the six four counties in the state, there's a whole lot of those counties that they're about 50% of Medicaid. 
and that that's tough. But my my main uh, concern with healthcare in rural Colorado is we have to protect our rural hospitals and our facilities because you can have the best health insurance in the world if you don't have a facility to treat you, it's worthless. So I'm I'm on I'm on the Hackstall Hospital board down at Grand River, but I can tell you in the legislature, I really work to protect our critical access hospitals because they have they have to make it monetarily, right? Uh, Craig Memorial and Craig's had issues. Uh, they're kind of getting back on their feet, but we have to have, you know, it's people worry about, you know, surgeries and those type of things. If you're in Rangeley and get bucked off your horse and got a bro broken arm, you, know, <laughs> you don't need surgery. You need to get to the hospital and get some things taken care of. And that critical access hospital provides that. We need to do that in our rural communities. I see it uh, in, in 57, uh, now 57 obviously has changed. So it's, it's somewhat different because I don't have the, the Meeker Pioneer and, and uh, Rains and Craig hospitals, but we have the same issues with, with Rifle and, and Up Valley to the Upper Roaring Fork in this new district. So we have to protect our, our healthcare facilities. And then the, the, um, the price of healthcare run bills on uh, prescription producing prescription drug prices this year we, we take a little bite of the apple each time but it's you just can't uh, make it affordable for everyone elizabeth 30 second rebuttal in our communities we have some of the most expensive hospitals in the country so these are we know who's getting all the money and who's lining their pockets and who is feeling the pressure and that's where working families or working families are the ones that are not having access to quality health care um, and i look forward to making sure that we stand up against special interests and that we put our community first and that our working families have access to um, to quality health care Perry, what could the uh, legislature do to help increase mental health care accessibility for rural communities? So this year we, we spent a lot of money um, helping with behavioral health, ran several bills on behavioral health as well, along with telehealth. I think one of the uh, telehealth bill I ran was one of the best uh, mental health bills uh, that I've been involved with. But we understand that need in these communities, especially in rural Colorado, um, we, you can talk to your, your uh, law enforcement people. Um, we, we need places, beds, and facilities for people that are in crisis to go to. We put a little, I think it was around 400, and, around 400 million into this this year in the behavioral health system in Colorado. Obviously, rural Colorado received some of that as well. But it's, a, you know, we talk about the uh, rural urban divide. Uh, <laughs> that's a real that's a real problem when you're trying to get help in rural Colorado and because we don't have the facilities but we're working on that and mental health is probably the number one thing you know in Denver if you look at it they, they figure they spend about a hundred thousand dollars per homeless person in Denver we spend 19,000 in Denver teaching our kids, school kids so we need to we need to address it and address it in the right ways and um, we're doing it a little bit at a time. Uh, again, it's just not a magic wand that you can just fix. You can you can say you can, but when you get there, it's not that easy. Elizabeth, mental health care accessibility. How would you improve it? Yeah, you know, I work very closely with the school districts, and I know that access to health care has been an issue for our young students, especially when they have one counselor serving 400 students in a school. So I think that our students and our young uh, people deserve better and we have to do better. And I know that we need more addiction centers. We need more access to rehabilitation centers. Uh, we need to make sure that whenever someone's looking for for a counselor that they have access to one. And I've worked with workers' compensation clients for a long time doing interpreting and, and translation. And I know that whenever someone has a long case, there's a lot of mental health issues that come with that, with losing your job, with having an injury. 
and a lot of times people don't have access to, to uh, mental health care. Um, so I think that we need to work on supporting CMC so that they can train more providers. We need to work with our nonprofits because they are the ones who are offering those youth uh, support groups. And we need to make sure that uh, you know, these resources are available to the, to the youth and to our community so that they, they know what to do whenever there's an emergency. And I also know that our EMTs and our, um, our paramedics also need the support. They need to make a living wage. They need to be able um, to protect their families. So I look forward to doing that at the Capitol. Gary, 30 seconds response. So the, um, that, I mean, it's a, it's a tough one. We, we, we ran a bill this year to, to get counseling for youth and adolescents. Um, met with two constituents uh, night before last about this very issue. It's about funding. It's, um, it's trying to find funding to help, help the situation out. I know, you know, the state budget, since I've been there, I've been there four years, the state bu budget has went up $13 billion. Thirteen billion since I've been there, so uh, we need to read, we need to direct the money in the proper places, and I think behavioral health is a great place to start. Final question, Elizabeth, uh, regarding education. How do you think the legislature could work to improve K through twelve, K through twelve, and higher education in our community? And the access to higher education um, has been limited. I had to work two jobs to put myself through college and CMC was a lifeline. CMC was my, my only choice at that time for a quality education. So I know that our community colleges are doing a great job of, of growing and offering these really good uh, opportunities for our students. Uh, but also I see that there's a lot of inequality when it comes to education in the district. We see that um, the two districts in uh, RE2 and RE16 are sharing staff, uh, they're sharing bus drivers and, and other staff and only having four day school weeks. And then we have uh, our other school district who have access to more resources. So I, we need to make sure that everyone, no matter where they live, that all our students have access to a quality education. And that comes with um, making sure that we are working on our formula for education and that we are um, working together. I also see that our local businesses have supported CMC apprenticeships. And I also know that the trades are a great path. Uh, my husband is a car mechanic and he's done a, a great He's had a great career with that. And I know that we need electricians, that we need uh, plumbers, that we need um, firefighters. So I look forward to supporting our community college. All right, K okay, through 12 and higher ed. Yeah, well, I'll start off by agreeing that, you know, we need skilled trades and we need, not, not every kid knows, needs to go to college and we need to start pointing them in that direction to do other things instead of a four-year college degree. but. Uh, rural education dollars. I fight for that every day over there to try to get the money for rural Colorado and the rural schools. And it, you know, it, it's costly. And, and in a lot of the busing and the different things that are that, that we deal with in rural Colorado, it, it costs a lot of money. The teachers, teacher pay, I think is uh, is utmost, especially for retention of teachers, because if you retain good teachers, also you have good. You have good students. You have good student outcomes, and so uh, we we need to retain our good our good teachers, and that's that's one of the ways to do it. Fighting for funding, the BS factor was talked about before. We paid that down probably as low. Well, I know it's as low as it's been since I've been at the legislature, but we need to pay that down more and more funding into our rural schools and uh, more money for our teachers, so that they can afford to live here in these communities. We're not unique. You look at these communities across, especially Western Colorado, we're not unique. Affordability is tough, especially if it's any resort area. Affordability is tough. So fight, fight for education, fight for education dollars. Elizabeth, 30-second uh, response. 
Yeah, and also we need to take advantage of all the federal funding. Uh, right now there's federal funds for electric buses for our kids so that they're not inhaling that those toxic fumes when they're on their way to school. We also have a ballot initiative uh, for healthy foods for all students in school from K to 12, to 12. And that's I think that that's a great, a great initiative to make sure that our kids uh, are not hungry and they're able to learn and they're able to focus and have access to healthy foods at school. All right, closing statements. Um, we'll start with Perry, two minutes. Thank you. The, uh, I'm gonna uh, spend a little bit of the time on the electric school buses, but uh, there's hundreds of millions of dollars being spent on that. And so that's, that's also a part, you know, understand moving, moving green and going that direction, but we also need to educate our kids. And, you know, they're, they're not reading at grade level. They're not doing math at grade level. So um, we need to really focus there. But so I'm a West Slope legislator serving in a very urban dominated legislature over there. And the house is 4124. I can tell you the, uh, you know, I'm representing three counties, right? There's lots of legislators over there, but their district is a mile wide and four miles long. And they don't, they don't understand. So 75% of the population of Colorado lives within 25 miles of I-25. And that's what we're up against as a rural legislator over there. So you need a strong voice, someone that understands Western Colorado, understands the issues we have over here, understands the water, understands transportation, understands jobs, un understand the issues we've had with bills and poor policy that's come out from under that gold dome that's killed some of our rural communities and killed the jobs. So yes, we all have to work together, but we have to blend it and I've been a strong voice over there and I want to continue to be, and I really would be honored by your vote in, in November 8th, because I feel that I can, uh, I can stand up for Western Colorado. I can stand up for rural Colorado. Um, and I'm, I'll pat myself on the back. I'm well thought of over there. Ask any legislator over there. If I'm easy to get along with, if I run good bills and I, and I, represent my district and my people. And uh, I challenge any of you, ask any legislator over there, call them and ask them, they'll tell you. And I wanna to continue to do that. I would be honored by your vote, thank you. Elizabeth, two minutes. Thank you so much. And I am asking for your support uh, for your vote. The ballots come out in two weeks and then uh, election day on November 8th. and you know, the stakes of this election could not be higher. We have an opportunity to flip this seat, to have new ideas, to have a fresh perspective, to have a strong voice. And I know the issues in our community because I've lived them. And I will always stand up for Western Colorado. I know that we have to work together and that includes our ranchers or small businesses or community colleges. And really always putting a rural community first because I know that we are not Denver, that we are rural Colorado, we are the Western Slope, and I will make sure that I am always doing what's right for us and what's right for our community, and that I am the one leading when it comes to water, when it comes to fire mitigation, when it comes to protecting our watersheds, when it comes to making sure our kids have access to opportunities and resources, and I will make sure that uh, my door is always open that I have those uh, really good communication streams so that I'm able to hear from everyone. And I will come to you and come and meet you where you are. Um, you know, no matter if you live in Silt in the Hills uh, or if you live in Aspen or if, especially Garfield County, I live here in Glenwood Springs. This has been my home. So I look forward to representing you proudly at the, at the Capitol. Um, I'm, as a wildland firefighter, I have fought to protect our communities. As a small business owner, I had, uh, I've been working on uh, creating really good paying jobs and supporting our economy. So I look forward to representing you and I hope to have your vote uh, because I know that we are stronger together. Our House District 57 candidates, Perry Will and Elizabeth Velasco. Thank you very much.
Next, we'll be uh, have a, we'll have a discussion on ballot issue two C, the Glenwood Springs accommodations tax. Clark Anderson, yes for workforce housing. Zach Parsons, citizens concerned about city council. All right, Clark, we'll begin with you. Yes, for workforce housing, two minute opening statement. Well, thank you very much. Um, you know, we've got a problem in this community and we're all aware of it. We all see it every day. Too many of the people who work in this community who are part of our businesses and part of our neighborhoods and part of our schools, uh, they can't actually afford to live here. And we all know that it's hurting our economy. We know it's a struggle for businesses. And we know that ultimately it's, it's hurting the fabric of our community. 2C provides us as a community of Glenwood Springs with an opportunity to create much needed resources to really begin tackling this issue. 2C provides us with uh, a, a practical and proven solution. It's been used in other communities and can be used effectively here to invest in sensible strategies like motel conversions or incentives for accessory dwelling units or gap financing for uh, workforce housing projects or down payment assistance. Those are the types of locally tailored solutions that 2C is all about. Uh, the good news is we won't actually pay for it as locals. 2C is funded by a modest 2.5% increase in our lodging tax. So our short-term rentals and our other accommodations are, uh, are helping provide the revenue because the visitors who stay in them are, are paying for this. And what that allows us to do is to tackle this problem in a, in a meaningful way uh, with the resources that we need to do so. 2C also provides some very sensible safeguards that ensure that this funding will be used effectively and provide accountability, like a, uh, a board, independent board that will oversee the investments. Uh, the funding can only be used for uh, our Glenwood Springs workforce, people who work in local Glenwood businesses, uh, a 20 uh, year sunset, an annual audit, and the funding uh, cannot be moved to any other part of the budget. So it all has to go towards workforce housing. Thank you. Zach, two minutes. All right, thank you very much. There's two questions that have to be asked. The first one is, is the city of Glenwood Springs doing a good job with the budget that they have currently and the record-breaking tax revenues that they're currently bringing in? And the second question is, do you trust the city of Glenwood Springs to do a good job with even more money? And I submit to you that the answer is no. You can look at project after project, year after year, that this city and this city council has messed up. You can drive across Midland Avenue and see four different fences, four different colors, on a project that was touted as being a significant street action with federal dollars being invested. But the city's plan turned out to not be what we were promised, a beautiful street. We got four different fences. It, the examples go on and on. You can look at roundabouts where trucks get stuck and they can't even get through. You can look at a city of Glenwood Springs who can't find a city manager and so they're gonna spend $10,000 more along with an additional housing stipend, along with an additional increase in the amount that they're going to pay an individual just to try to bring someone to the city to work with this mess of a city council. Now, I wanna to respond to a couple of the thoughts that Clark brought up and one of them is that see people from out of town are gonna to be the only ones paying for that and this is not the case. Lodging owners are going to be forced to make a decision as to what to do and whether or not they have to the ability to pass those funds onto, out, uh, onto the other tourists. If you walk around town and talk to lodging owners, uh, one of them is eight out of their 10 employees are currently housed on site in the hotel. Another one, six out of 10 live on the property. And so why are we targeting the lodging community with this tax when they're the ones who are actually trying to solve some of the housing issues? But instead, the city wants to pick on them because they think they can get away with it. And that's the only ballot measure they can pass. We'll talk about that more. 
First question for Zach, and each each of you will be asked the same question, and the response will be 60 seconds. Zach, how do we determine who within our local workforce benefits from this funding? It's a great question. Uh, one of the conversations I tried to have with members of city council was, what about the people who live in these hotels and motels during the off season? Uh, they're using that for short term housing in order to get through, get by, but now we're going to tax them in addition just to pay for their own housing. I propose maybe we could do a tax holiday during the winter months when uh, the properties weren't making as much money. We could look at, look at the opportunities to, to provide some sort of a relief. City Council wasn't interested in that. We could look at uh, opportunities to try to make sure that we have limits on uh, who in the city limits and, and what residents can actually have access to it. But the city wasn't interested in that either. You, you see, it's not limited just to people working in the city of Glenwood Springs because the language says anyone who is a resident of Glenwood Springs, uh, legalistic, I know we're getting into the legalese, but ultimately it's splitting hairs, but the city council has to basically go along with that. You have to trust them to do that. And frankly, we don't. All right, same question. I apologize. Uh, there was a typo. 90 seconds. So no, oh, no, okay. So. Fair, fair enough. That's why I stopped there, but no worries. <laughs> okay. Again? Um, Mark, go ahead. Uh, how do we determine who within our local workforce benefits from this funding? Well, who benefits is determined by a system that we have in place now. And that system is designed to ensure that our workforce housing solutions that we currently have today, there are actually programs that exist. Um, in our community that are targeting support for or housing for our uh, existing workforce and um, we can build on those. And that system is one that uh, provides a, a system of looking at who lives within the city of Glenwood Springs proper. And then it steps out from that to the 81601 area code to ensure that these are folks who, and, and to be eligible, you need to uh, you need to work for a business that's located in those areas. So that is an eligibility requirement that was part of the recommendation. It's part of the implementing ordinance. And that is uh, that eligibility requirement is part of this proposal. And so these funds will support our local workforce, and they're designed only to do that. These won't be funds that can be used in any other form. Um, the other people that I think it's really important we look to in terms of who's benefiting is the businesses. We spent significant amount of time talking to the businesses in Glenwood Springs, understanding their needs, understanding their challenges. And it is very clear that this is needed. They need this support. Their workers need this support. It is making it harder and harder to operate a business in Glenwood Springs because people are spending more and more time in their car. It's harder and harder to hire and retain staff. And that is hurting our business community. We're already losing businesses because of this. So that's who else benefits. Zach, 30 second rebuttal. Sure. Um, one thing that stood out there is 81601. Uh, that's not the city limits of Glenwood Springs. And so you as taxpayers in the city of Glenwood Springs are asking to basically fund workforce housing that go outside of the city limits. Uh, another thing that stood out from what was just said is the local businesses are going to be the ones who benefit, not the ones being taxed. The other businesses who are trying to put off that tax onto the lodging community are going to benefit. And I asked you how that's fair. Clark, do you think the uh, workforce housing fund will spur further growth of Glenwood Springs? Why or why not? That's a great question. You know, look, we all love Glenwood Springs, and um, I think we want to keep the parts about Glenwood Springs that are great today. We want to keep them that way. Uh, so it's a good question. The reality is this is not going to have any influence over the way that Glenwood, the amount or way that Glenwood grows over the next 20 years. Uh, Glenwood Springs is going to grow over the next 20 years. That's going to happen. It's, it's a sure thing. And if you think that not voting for this is going to slow growth in Glenwood Springs, you're going to be really disappointed because that's not what's going to happen. What this will do is give our community more control over the growth that's going to happen so that when future development comes, we are better able and better prepared to influence how that development occurs and to ensure that more of it is actually affordable to the people who work in our community. And that's the idea. So if you would like to ensure that we have more control over growth, that we are better able to manage growth, 
then voting for 2C is a good idea. To think that we are going to be able to, that, that $1.5 million a year is going to suddenly spur an amazing amount of growth in Glenwood Springs is silly. And anybody that thinks that that's the case, uh, it's simply not going to happen. Glenwood Springs has had a fairly consistent growth trajectory with some periods of high growth and then leveling off and periods of high growth again uh, for decades now. And this isn't going to change that. All this is going to do is make it easier for us to shape the growth and development that we want so that it's a more livable and sustainable future. Zach, same question, 90 seconds. So I sat in the same room when the mayor was debating this issue. And uh, the mayor decided to say uh, that he wanted to seek uh, as many funding sources to build as much workforce housing as possible. So if you think this is just the beginning, you're not even taking the mayor at his own words. Uh, ultimately, everything that Clark just described, if we were talking about empowering the committee of community stakeholders to make these decisions, it'd be a much harder decision, I think. I I'd have a much harder time going across Glenwood Springs talking to people about the concerns that they have because these people are trusted. City council is not. City Council is the one who's going to have to make these decisions that Clark was just talking about. City Council is the one who's going to have to make decisions about how growth is allocated. And what we're talking about is shifting growth from private development to public development. So the question is, do you trust the city of Glenwood Springs to go out there and to direct how we're going to build houses and where we're going to build them? Or do you trust a private market? I think the answer is clear. Anything the city touches falls apart. Why would you support it if it's going to be that way? They've already had options that have been successful where they gave money to people like Habitat for Humanity, other organizations. But this, this empowers the city to have way too much control over additional money when they've already proved they can't handle it. Clark, 30-second rebuttal. Yeah, sure. Um, there's a couple things to make sure we're really clear about here. First of all, we're talking about five generations of city councils here. So whatever your feeling is about the current city council, uh, that's really not the question at hand. Okay, what we're talking about is creating much needed resources for the most significant challenge facing our economy. We need tools to be able to take this on and that's what this provides. Uh, the other thing is that this is not going to be public development. If you're suggesting that we can start doing public development with uh, $1.5 million a year, we can't. This is going to provide gap financing for public-private partnerships and small incentives for local homeowners and down payment assistance. That is not public housing projects, so it's, it's in disingenuous to suggest it is. Do I have more time? No. Oh, okay. Okay. What assurances do citizens have that these funds will be used for workforce housing, Zach? Well, you know, the first thing that stands out is when you look at the costs, one of the costs that can be attributed to this is administration costs. So the question that follows is, are we looking at a housing czar to be basically paid for out of this funds? I mean, who's going to administer this? The city is basically going to go out and hire somebody else, pay for another massive study, and at the end of the day, we're going to see $1.5 million basically turn into 600 grand because the city's going to waste half of it. At the, the end of the day, you have to look at just some of the basics that have happened in this very chamber. Uh, Councilman Hershey proposed uh, a, a, a proposal that said that council members should not be allowed to profit off of this indefinitely, should not be able to make any money in perpetuity. You know what it was met with? Silence. Not even a second, not a debate, nothing. I sat in a courtroom when a former council person was sentenced and prevented from ever holding public office ever again. We have to make sure as a town that we are holding our elected officials accountable and in particular, our members of the city council accountable. And the way to do that is to make sure that we're not giving them blank checks. This ballot measure essentially allows the city to determine how to spend that money. If it was just what Clark was saying, there'd be a different story. But don't trust the mayor and the rest of the council to start building giant developments or whatever else they decide to do with the money that they're saying they're going to be able to raise in addition to this. 
Accountability is really important. Um, and I think it's probably useful to take a look at the implementing ordinance um, that provides a lot of accountability measures. It provides for things like a, establishing a distinct seven member board that's going to really implement these funds. Uh, it explicitly says that the funds can only be used for direct program costs. Uh, and so it lays out a lot of these important points. Uh, it also explains that uh, there will be an annual audit. It explains that uh, there's a 20 year sunset. So those provide accountability. And at the end of the day, we are going to be able to, as a community, uh, hold our council members uh, accountable to everything they do. This is not about the council today. This is about solving a long-term challenge for our community and creating the resources we need to do that. It's very easy to make this about today's council, but that is, that is a distraction from what we're really talking about, which is how do we create an economy in Glenwood Springs that's truly viable? I have talked to members of the businesses community who have said to me, this is a question of viability for us. Uh, this is a question for how do we continue to make it work here? because this problem is becoming so significant that we're asking really hard questions about how we operate. And these aren't just low paying jobs. I'm talking about things like senior living facilities. Okay, so how, thank you. Sorry. Zach, 30 second rebuttal. You know, it is about the city council because they're the ones who are going to make the decisions with the money right now, if you decide to vote for this measure. Back on May 27th, they hired WR Communications and an individual named Bill Ray. If you actually pull the contract, it says, quote, we should begin to develop a survey questionnaire and narrative around the city's housing challenges. That was part of what this city hired a communication director and basically a PR op to do before this was even put on the ballot. At the end of the day, this city is the one who has to make some of these decisions. And I, I wish we had a different council. I wish that may, maybe members of this group were up here and be able to decide some of the different, the different factors and the different ways this could happen. But at the end of the day, you have to trust that they're not going to change an ordinance number. I'm sorry, I'm out of time. My bad. Final question. Clark, how do you think the additional tax could impact our tourism economy? Well, our tourism economy is very important. And the businesses of this community are restaurants all along 7th Street and throughout the community, um, the different stores we have, the outdoor stores. I mean, those are all a part of our tourism economy, as are our attractions like the Adventure Park, the Hot Springs. And these are all businesses that are supported by a broader uh, ecosystem of businesses that need employees. We have to be able to keep and retain employees. Tom said it pretty square the other night when he said that our local economy, the biggest challenge facing it is housing. And so, yes, tourism is critical, but this is not going to hurt our tourism economy. Glenwood Springs is an amazing place. People are going to keep coming visiting here. We have outstanding assets. What we need to be able to do is make sure that we can sustain this community and sustain this economy over the long term. And this tool is one part of doing that. It's not a silver bullet. This isn't gonna solve all of our problems in terms of housing or otherwise. But what this is gonna do is give us a leg up so that we can start making meaningful progress on one of the most challenging problems we have in our community so that we can have a viable tourism economy over the long term. Zach, 90 seconds. So when this was originally floated, the question is whether or not to have an attractions tax along with a lodging tax. You'll notice what the result was. It's just a lodging tax. And the reason why is because there's not enough of the lodging business owners to be able to gather around in this, in this town to be able to really stand up for it, uh, stand against it. They're doing their best. But when you look at the attractions tax, the amount of businesses that were upset about just the very mention of it scared it off. Glenwood Springs is a family-friendly, affordable town. It's built its reputation that way. It's not Aspen. It's not Vail. So it, it is going to be affecting our economy and our tourism in one way or another. Whether or not it's the business owners that have to eat that cost 
and decide not to include another option for housing for one of their employees, maybe now they're going to be able to have seven on site instead of eight because they have to rent out one more room in order to afford this additional tax revenue. Or it, it could be the fact that they pass it on to that family. The family of four who wants to go on the vacation for the first time in 10 years from the city of Denver, because coming to Glen was the best vacation they can afford. They wanna go rafting. They wanna be able to go to a hot springs pool, but they're seeing cost after cost increase. And then their hotel, they're paying two and a half percent more. 5% total increase or 5% extra tax just on lodging, just because they're coming to visit the city of Glen Springs. It is going to hurt our tourism economy. Mark, 30 second rebuttal. I think the point that Glenwood is a family friendly community is really important, but I don't think we can keep saying it's an affordable community. And I don't think we'll be able to either because our businesses are already having to increase their costs to be able to address this problem. The market is absorbing this. You've all seen it. It's more expensive to go to our restaurants. It's already more expensive to go to our hotels and our lodging. And a big part of that is because we cannot keep and retain staff in our businesses. And the reality is what we're talking about is a modest tax increase that keeps us in completely competitive with other communities. You look around other communities, Fruta, Breckenridge, uh, Fruta, Silverthorne, Grand Junction, 60% uh, of the 22 peer, oh, I'm sorry. I to... forget what's 30 seconds and what's not. It's very hard to keep track of time. He's very good. And I'm like, just like, let's go. All right, we'll go to closing statements, uh, two minutes, and we'll begin with Zach. There's no doubt that housing is a global, uh, national, uh, it's, a, it's a massive issue um, for a number of individuals, both across the United States and the world. There are policymakers who are actively working to solve that. The Federal Reserve's two big tasks are housing and employment. We hear national level policymakers in both Congress as well as the president working on things like the Inflation Reduction Act. We heard state level representatives today talk about different options that they've worked on, the bills that they've run, what they've done to try to attack affordable housing. All of those people are a billion times smarter than the current city council that we have, and they're not able to solve the problem yet. It's because it's a difficult problem to solve. Throwing $1.5 million at it isn't going to do anything, but throwing $1.5 million at our streets is gonna do something. It's gonna make sure that we have the ability to actually have people come to Glenwood, to be able to drive through our town and appreciate that they can get from point A to point B. Putting in things like, uh, uh, putting in things to help with our traffic management, to help with some of our growth issues that Glenwood's facing. Those are places for city council to spend money. Those are places for them to spend their time. But to trust them with a blank check and to say, oh, please use this to, to do pay downs for mortgages, or please use this to, to try to help make sure that certain people have access to housing. When in reality, the way the bill is written, the way this ordinance is written, allows the city to empire bill, to buy property, to bank that property, and to make you compete for it if you're looking for property. They're going to be on the open market paying whatever they can, whatever they have, whatever money they want to, whatever, whatever the money they want to pay. And at the end of the day, they're shifting development from the private sector to the public sector. That's why you cannot vote for this bill or this measure. Thank you. Clark, two minutes. This is an awesome town. I love this community. I'm, I'm raising my kids here. Um, and I really hope we can keep it the type of place it is today. And if we're gonna do something about this problem, it's time to act. Um, you know, it's very easy to try to distract from the issue at hand. And the issue at hand is that right now, our economy's number one challenge is the lack of workforce housing. Is it tough to solve? Yeah, it for sure is. That's why we need some resources to work on it. Does that mean we should just ignore it? No. Uh, there's nothing that we're talking about here that is not 
completely practical and sensible. And I want to talk a little bit about how we got here. I am one of many people, businesses, residents, a coalition of people who have been working on this issue for months. And this is well thought through. We had people from the lodging industry, from the business industry, uh, all types of people in our community worked through and learned what's working and what isn't in other places. And we put together a program that reflects what does work and doesn't. It's an open book test. So we have the benefit of seeing and learning from those other places. And that's what we put in place. And it's things like the accountability measures I mentioned to make sure that these funds will only be used for our workforce. It's making sure that you know, as locals, we're not going to pay for this. So that makes it easier for us to absorb. And it ensures that we are over time going to build an inventory of housing that our workforce can afford that balances out our market. And that is not ever gonna happen in this through public housing development. It will always be through creative strategies that partner with the private sector or incentivize the private sector to help us solve this problem. It's very practical. These are strategies that are working in other places. And if we're for our workforce and our businesses, then we've got to be for 2C. Thank you. Yes or no on 2C. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, we conclude our forum with uh, our Garfield County Commission, Commissioner District 1 candidates, Ryan Gordon and Tom Jankowski. Good evening. We will begin with two minutes opening statements and we'll start with Ryan. Great. Thanks everybody for hosting this event. I think it's really important that we all get to hear your candidates. Um, to the Global Post and KMTS, I also want to thank my family for uh, uh, putting up with me running. It takes a lot of time and effort. Uh, I was born and raised here in Glenwood Springs. I went to high school at Glenwood Springs High School and graduated. Uh, got a civil engineer degree in uh, Fort Collins, Colorado at CSU. Uh, I moved to California and then um, eventually to Portland, Oregon, uh, where when my wife and I had our first child and were pregnant with our second, we decided to move back to Glenwood Springs, where we wanted to raise our kids in Garfield County, which is a place that we all love so much for a lot of the things the other candidates have talked about, the open space, the rivers, the people, and the opportunity. I want to bring this engineering mindset to the county commissioner. And that is practical solutions and problem solving. I think it's really important that we bring that mindset. I also think it's really important that we bring collaborative leadership to the role. We need to work together with all of our neighbors, with our neighboring communities and counties. It's something that has not happened to the greatest frequency that I think needs to happen. We really need to work together. Our issues are extremely complex, as mentioned here with, with, with affordable housing, a solution can't just be done with the county. It needs to be done from Parachute to Aspen, including Eagle, Pitkin, and even Mesa County, where we see um, quite a few workers live. I think it's really important that we have this, again, this collaborative leadership that we're really working across boundaries. It's the only way that we're going to solve a lot of our complex issues. Um, thank you very much. Tom, two minutes. Okay, I also want to thank... Uh the uh, Glenwood Springs Chamber Resort Association, uh, Glenwood Springs Post Independent, KMTS, as, as all the other candidates have done uh, for hosting this forum. I'm a third generation Coloradoan. I grew up in Sterling, Colorado. I came to the Western Slope in 1973 to work for my Uncle Joe at Arapaho Basin. Moved to Garfield County in 1985 as the general manager of Sunlight Mountain Resort. And I stayed at Sunlight Mountain Resort from uh, 1985 to 2014. I'm running for re-election because I'm, I'm concerned about the future of Garfield County. And I'm concerned about the, the, that future for my kids and for my grandkids and for your kids and your grandkids. 
There are, uh, there's a number of issues. I'm gonna go over some of them, big issues that are, that are gonna happen in the next four years that, that the county will need to tackle. That's uh, public safety, housing, which we just, we've heard quite a bit about, energy and inflation, economic development, drug and alcohol abuse and addiction, and our mental health crisis. We're looking probably at a recession here in, in early uh, 23. And then we have infrastructure needs, not just county infrastructure needs, but we have infrastructure needs for new interchange in Silt, new interchange in, in um, Newcastle. And we also we need, to, we need to get the South Bridge done and we need to get that interchange um, in place. I have 50 years of experience in the private sector working on public lands and 12 years of experience in the public sector. And I wanna thank everybody for being here and I look forward to our discussion tonight. So thank you. Tom, first question, you mentioned a number of issues and challenges. Um, if you would highlight, say that maybe the two or three most important issues facing the county uh, and how would you work to address those if reelected? Yeah, one, one I wanna talk about is, uh, it probably won't get talked about here, but I think it's high on my list is public safety. You know, we, you look at uh, urban United States and there's an increase in violent crime. Well, that's, that's happening now in, in rural Colorado, rural United States. Um, president, no, not president, Governor Polis and the legislature, they, they put in a new law this year that does uh, no cash bail. We now have uh, we have bail we have bail court on Saturdays as well, with new law that uh, drug drug possessions for opioids, fentanyl, methamphetamines is no longer a a, a felony but a misdemeanor, and we, we're seeing a rise in 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 crime in our violent crime in our community. Now I'll just give you an example. My children, my grandchildren. We're playing in Veltas Park about three months ago, and all of a sudden bullets went whizzing across the top of their head, and they ran for shelter. And there was a dispute in the next uh, in the trailer park next door, a tenant landlord dispute. And I'll just say that you know the sheriff uh, he he the sheriff the, the DA prosecutes the sheriff. Um, he picks people up, puts them in jail, but the county commissioners are the ones that fund them. And, and we will, um, I'll stop there. Uh, Ryan, if you're elected, uh, some of the, give me the two, two or three uh, top issues that uh, Garfield County faces and how would you address those? Yeah, <clears throat> well, certainly as if you heard today from a lot of others, um, you know, affordable housing is, is absolutely number one. Um, I've spoke to several business leaders in the Valley who just simply can't find workers. And when they do, they can't find housing for those workers. And they're actually considering leaving the Valley, taking that critical tax revenue with them. And that is gonna be a tragedy if that happens. Obviously, as been debated here, you know, affordable housing is a very complex and challenging issue and is not gonna be solved by one entity, one person. Again, back to this collaborative leadership, we need this approach. There was the Roaring Fork Housing Coalition was started looking to bring on communities. Our Garfield County commissioners voted to not join the leadership, not, excuse me, not, not vote this coalition until all of the counties joined, all of the cities in Garfield County joined. I think that was a mistake. I think we need to show leadership and take that first step, show the other communities that it is important, that we do value affordable housing. Another really critical issue is economic diversity. Now we get over 50% of our revenue from oil and gas. Don't get me wrong, oil and gas is absolutely needed. And I think we continue to need to look to drill where, where appropriately. But we need to diversify our economy. Let's increase our access to our natural resources, more boat ramps, more trailheads. Let's support our current farmers and ranchers so we can get locally raised food, but also preserve this open space. Let's look to bring in innovative technologies, whether it's renewable energy or otherwise. And let's also look to have uh, bring in other small businesses to help support our local economy. Tom, 30 second rebuttal. Okay, first, first of all, um, Garfield County gets 25% of its uh, property tax from the oil and gas industry, not, not 50%. Second of all, I, 
voted that we should join that coalition. But housing is a very it's, it's very complex, and and it, we are, we're going to make a difference in housing from every sector. You know, nonprofit sector, government sector, and the private sector. And don't think the private sector has is forgotten about uh, housing in Garfield County. This year we have 750 starts in Garfield County alone. Next question for Ryan. Do you believe in the concept of keeping a distinct separation of church and state at the federal level? And how does that come into play at the county government level? Well, I certainly support a separation of church and state. I think that's one of our founding principles um, when our country was founded. I think it's important to keep that separate um, um, in order to have a, a well-run government and in a community here. I'm not sure exactly how that down how that that is played out at the at the county level um i think it's critical that we observe and respect everybody's opinions everybody's religious beliefs and allow them to participate um as, as they want um i think it's really critical that we support where this happens obviously there's places in the churches and whatnot but let's also look to our schools let's make sure that we are providing the opportunity for our school kids to learn uh, a, a diverse range of experiences and beliefs it's really critical for them to be able to have that experience. Tom, 90 seconds. Yeah, well, well, thank you for that question. That that question brings a smile to my face, actually, because there's been a lot of letters to the editor about church and state and, and me going to a, a meeting at Cornerstone Church and uh, listening to somebody talk. And I, I was actually invited to that uh, meeting by a Latina and was, was happy to go to that with her. Uh, but I absolutely believe in the separation of church and state. And uh, I have a 12 year record and you can go back on that record and look, and you're not gonna find uh, from me or, or I think from the other commissioners, a, a uh, there's a separation there. We're not bringing the church back into our, into our discussions. We do have a moment of silence in the morning in your own way. And you know, for that moment of silence, I, I say to myself, uh, may I be humble, may I listen, may I be respectful, and may I make the best decisions I can for Garfield County. And so um, I, 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 I'm happy we had that, that question. Ryan, uh, 30 seconds. Rebecca. Yeah, I, I, I think what I want to say here is that we need to provide a, a forceful voice of support for all beliefs um, not just religious, but also LGBTQ community. Um, I, I think we as leaders should be the face of this and should provide public support to make sure that everybody feels welcomed and open and that we have clear transparency throughout our, our local government. Next question, uh, Tom. Commissioner seats and races are often decided by very close margins. Um, if elected in that uh, 51 or 52% per margin of victory holds true, how do you balance representation of the interests of the small majority of county voters who elected you and the divergent interests of the slight minority? Uh, and, and that's a good question. I think we, um, you know, we're, we're a purple county. We're 49% um, now unaffiliated. And I think part of the reason for that is because people are, fed up with uh, the partisan politics that go on at a national level. But, I, but I'm a local elected official and decisions I make, so many of them are just, just their administration, the administration of the county. You know, land use decisions are not based on your, on your party affiliation by any means. They're, they're, they're based usually on neighborhoods. And um, that may be the one, one place where where in the past I've had differences with my opponent have been on, on oil and gas because I support the oil and gas industry. But with, uh, with Ryan, that's not necessarily the case because I believe he supports that industry as well. So, um, so, so yes, I, I think we, we do and we try to support all, all the uh, citizens of Garfield County and especially now the Latino community. We're 32% Latino. And Garfield County has a Latino commission that I'm the liaison with, and and uh, and and this is a very diverse county, and I think we work well together in, in most cases. So thank you. 
Ryan, 90 seconds. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so T Tom mentioned we're basically a 50-50 county, which is spectacular because we get this wonderful melding pot of ideas and, and, and people. I think how we, how, we, how we balance that is we recognize that we have so many commonalities between us. We, we are all here for the reasons why I stated earlier. We love having the outdoors. We love the people. We love the opportunity. I think we need to honor our history of our county as well. Right before oil and gas was even here, we were a ranching ag community. So let's support our ranchers and farmers. Tom mentioned about the Latino community being a substantial part. And we absolutely need to bring those folks in and make them part of our community, make them part of our government. Look around at our councils and our other boards. We have very few of them. And I ask why? I think we haven't really made an effort. So Tom mentions this commission. This commission was started in 2021, not 1980. We've had lots of Latino people here for quite some time. Why haven't we made these outreaches earlier? We need to be better and forceful at bridging these gaps, at bringing people together. I do support oil and gas development. We absolutely need it. I drive a vehicle that, that runs on gasoline. My house is heated by gas. We can't switch off the, the switch right now. So let's support oil and gas but let's also support the other facets that make our county so wonderful. Tom, 30 second rebuttal. Okay, I, I, you know, one thing that's great about being a, a local elected official is you can make a difference for people. You can, they can come and talk to you. They can sometimes get right in your face to talk to you, but you can make a difference for people. And just, just wanna talk a little bit more about the Latino community committee and I was, uh, last week, I, I was sitting with them, listening to the folks from Apple Tree Park talk about their domestic water. And we had our, our health department, um, environmental health person there as well. Time. Ryan, District 1 encompasses primarily the eastern end of Garfield County, but decisions are made that affect the entire county. How do you balance the diverse needs of the entire county? Well, right. Um, very diverse, uh, well-rounded county, to say the least. Um, been knocking a lot of doors, talking to a lot of people, and there's a lot of commonalities. So I want to mention with my engineering background what I've done. I was the town engineer for Parachute for two and a half years, and I'm currently the town engineer for Snowmass Village. So I have seen the diverse groups, the diverse areas, I think there's a lot of ways of bringing people together. I think we can reach out and, and find those commonalities. Like I mentioned, one thing that we all support in this county is our outdoor resources. Look at Parachute with their, their local trail system. Look at Rifle with the Falls and the Rambo bike area. You know, Glenwood Springs, Newcastle, and Carbondale have a lot of those amenities and are working on those to expand them. We should also do that at the county level. Let's really push that. And, and, and make sure that we are uh, as, as one community. Again, I think there's a lot of ways that we can create more economic diversity, which again, will bring us together. Let's find ways of bringing in new small businesses. Let's also find ways of helping everybody out. That, that there is this divide, but I think it's a lot smaller than we actually think. Let's work together to look to solve our affordable housing and our other economic challenges. Ron, will you repeat that question? Certainly. District 1 encompasses primarily the eastern end of Garfield County, but decisions are made that affect the entire county. How do you balance the diverse needs of the county? Well, I think first thing you do is you listen. You listen to your constituents. And usually, if you listen, there's a, an answer there that uh, in your decision making. And, I'm, and so the decision making becomes much easier you don't, uh, and you know, it's, it's difficult sometimes when you have a whole neighborhood in front of you and uh, they're upset because it's not in my backyard on some sort of development, but uh, you need to listen and make, make the best decisions you can and be, um, and sometimes have some guts and backbone. So, so, but for the entire county, it's getting around the entire county. It is, is talking to the people in parachute. We do go to uh, town meetings with town councils all in, in every community and getting, it's, it, 
we're, we're local elected officials and that's that's kind of the bottom line there 30 second response yeah i, I mean I, I definitely agree tom said about talking to others talking to everybody i think that's actually very critical i think we have to find ways of making government more accessible a key cornerstone of our democracy is for our citizens to have access to our elected officials. I would like to see us try to increase that ability. You know, the only chance really um, our, our citizens have to interact with, with, with the commissioners during meetings is, is, is a short time during the week. Not everybody can take that time off. I think we should work to try to expand our outreach and, and, and talk to folks all the time. All right, next question, Tom. Uh, the county has spent a lot of money over the years on attorneys, consultants, lobbyists uh, regarding issues like the Greater Sage Grouse, Senate Bill 181, RS-2477 Rights of Way, Energy Development, RMI. Um, has it been worth it and why? Well, and, and those are really, they're, they're diverse. Each one of those issues is diverse and different, you know, and um, and we have spent a lot of time and, and energy on those. And I'll go back to what uh, Secretary of the Interior Bernhardt said here just, just last year and said that these public lands decisions, when they come in front of you, when they're, when they're made, you need to be at the table because when, they, when they're made, they last, they, they're really hard to undo. And so we need to be at the table. We need to talk about our, our positions. You know, Garfield County is, a, we're, we're a natural gas County. We have 11,000 wells. We have the second largest natural gas reserves in the United States. And, uh, you know, we need to make sure that uh, not, not just for Garfield County, but for, for the nation and, and maybe for the world that that gas is, is accessible. And there, there's a big push now to, uh, to there, there's a big push from environmentalists to make sure that it stays in the ground. So, um, then, but you go to RMI, you know, we're, we're joining the city of Glenwood Springs with RMI and we're, we're opposed to that, uh, to RMI. Or we, we gave a letter of support to Senator Bennett on the core act, which is takes out uh, Thompson divide from oil and gas drilling. So each one of these is, is different and um, they're complex. And when you're going up against the gut federal government, it, it, you got to have some, some guns to do that. Ryan, 90 seconds. Yeah, so obviously being at the table is really important. If you're not at the table, you're not listening and participating, you have no say in what happens. So absolutely, we have to be at the table in every single decision that's gonna affect Garfield County. One issue that's come up, Sweetwater Lake. So we've now lawyered up, and now we're gonna spend $60,000 to a Phoenix law firm to, to to do something. I'm not quite exactly sure what the end result is. I do agree with the commissioners that said, listen, we were not consulted. That's a problem. It's county land, you need to be involved. However, when we start lowering up and bringing in attorneys, everybody starts to get back on their heels and it's antagonistic. I do not believe that is the right approach to these issues. Why not offer a hand and say, hey, look, let's sit down at the table. Let's discuss. Let's have a discussion. Let's work together to talk about this. The U.S. Forest Service has made that abundantly clear that they want to include Garfield County, that they want to have these discussions. So let's take them up on the offer. Let's work with them to make sure that the proposed development fits the need of both the county and the residents of Sweetwater. We could be spending our $60,000 on Sweetwater or our multiple million dollars to fight oil and gas rules on something else. Let's work together. Let's find solutions as opposed to spending money on attorneys. Tom, 30 seconds. Yeah, yeah, my opponent's naive. I'll say that right now. If you think that's, that's the way things work with the federal government. Um, but I do wanna talk about Sweetwater Lake. Let's, let's talk about that a little bit. The uh, Nature Conservancy came in and bought Sweetwater Lake for $7.1 million. And they did that with a loan from GOCO for $6.25 million and then $350,000 from the people of uh, Sweetwater and $500,000 from Eagle County, $7.1 million. The U.S. Forest Service then went back to the Land and Water Conservation Fund. And uh, well, anyway, the bottom line is the Conservation Fund fleeced, fleeced 
the citizens, not only Garfield County of the United States out of $1.1 million. So many issues to cover, but uh, the hour is late. Ryan, on your website, you state, I am running because the county needs to have younger and innovative voices who can lead the county into the future. Do you think Tom Jankowski and the current board in general is too old to do the job? Well, I don't necessarily think it's an age issue per se. Um, I certainly respect what the board has done over the years and, and provided the years of dedicated service. What I do think is I do think their ideas and their approach is stale and needs to change. I've mentioned this many times and I'll mention it again, we need collaborative, cooperative leadership. We need to approach that includes more people and doesn't exclude others. That's more welcoming to a diverse amount of ideas. I think younger people have a larger stake in the game. Tom has grandchildren, I have children. I want Garfield County to be a place where when my kids are making a decision whether either to leave the Valley, Garfield County, or they're away and wanna move back, we've actually made the decisions that will set them up for success, that we have affordable housing, that we have good paying jobs, and we have an environment that still has water in the rivers and snow on the mountains. I feel like our current commissioners are not looking to the future and said they're looking to the past. They're doubling down on oil and gas, which again, we need some, but let's also diversify. Let's also find ways of bringing Garfield County into the future. Tom, 90 yeah, seconds. I've, you know, I hate to be called stale. But I, <laughs> um, so, so let's, you know, I'm besides oil and gas, I am a founding member of Garfield Clean Energy. You know, we've spent uh, well over $2 million on clean energy projects in Garfield County in the last uh, 10 years. We have uh, just put in a, a five megawatt uh, solar panel farm at CMC. There's a 10 megawatt solar panel farm going in at uh, west of Battlement Mesa. But I wanna talk a little bit about my opponent. I want, I want you to go to his website and take a look at his website and ask him, where's his, where's his public service? Where's his executive, where's his executive uh, and administrative um, service? And um, what, what nonprofits has he worked on? What public, you know, what uh, commissions, what government boards has he worked on? And you, you're not going to find anything. And so, um, you know, Ryan's, Ryan's a good guy, and, and I, I like him. And I like sitting next to him and having these debates, but he's not quite ready to become a county commissioner. Ryan, I assume you want to respond. Um, yes, thank you. Thank you. Well, I applaud the commissioners for investing in, in renewable energy. Let's double down and do more. We can achieve energy independence at a faster rate if we do actually invest in more energy independence projects like renewable energy and, and whatnot. Um, to the public service and, and the executive experience, um, Tom might know that might not, might not know this, but as engineering engineer, we actually are servants of the public. Our projects are funded by public taxpayer money and are for the benefit of the public. All right, two more questions. Tom, let's talk about affordable housing. We touched on it. You touched on it about during the uh, Realtors uh, Forum a few days ago. Um, and that's, that's a big issue statewide and it especially hits hard here in this valley. Uh, how can the county um, help facilitate um, affordable and attainable housing. And, you know, it, it, we're a big county, first of all. We go from uh, Carbondale, where the average price of a house is a million dollars, to Battlement Mesa, where the average price of a house is $365,000, and average price of a townhome or, uh, or condo is $235,000. So there's a big discrepancy in our, in our county. There's there's no doubt about that, but the county commissioners are doing things on housing. We get $3 million every year of HUD funds, and those funds go to um, first time home, home buyers for mortgages or, or down payments on their homes. And then we also have a, uh, 
We work with nonprofits like Garfield Housing Authority, which handles the uh, HUD rental vouchers. And we just gave $200,000 for ha to Habitat for Humanity for two houses in Rifle out of their 20, 20 home project there. We uh, have inclusive housing. So if, if you have a, have, um, you have a subdivision and you have there one in 10 homes is supposed to be inclusive or affordable housing. We also have um, ADUs as a use by right. So you can, for a thousand square foot ADU, you can, uh, you can go ahead and that puts another more into the housing stock. And then finally, we, uh, we made it a lot easier to subdivide. You can, uh, minor subdivisions are done by it through an administrative process. Right. Yeah. So, you know, affordable housing, again, is very complex and, and challenging issue. Certainly, we need to use every tool in the toolbox. We need to work with Habitat for Humanity and other nonprofits that will come in that aren't profit motivated in order to build and, and rent out houses. Um, we need to find ways of raising additional funds for affordable housing projects or housing assistance. So obviously, we heard Glenwood Springs is doing an accommodation tax. It was mentioned about an attraction tax. There's other ways too that I think we should consider. I think we should consider a real estate transfer tax and, can, and, and look at that to see if we can't raise some money from, from that avenue. Um, we certainly need to work with public and the private entities on, on every way we can. Tom mentioned about the affordable housing uh, requirements, one in 10, that's great. I think that's perfect. Let's make sure that whenever we have the opportunity that we are holding those con those those builders and contractors feet to the fire to make sure they're being built and being built in the locations of, of the housing areas. I think we really need to again work together. I don't claim to have all the answers or the smartest person out there. I want to bring in everybody who has something to say and try to pick the best ideas and find the right solutions. Only together can we solve affordable housing. Um, 30 seconds. Yeah, I, you know, you heard my opponent say we need a transfer tax. We need th this, you know, a regional tax. I mean, it's tax, tax, tax. And uh, this, this is the answer to this is going to come through the private sector. You know, the governments and nonprofits are going to be able to help, but it's going to come through the private sector. Stanley just walked, walked out here, but, you know, he's a local contractor. Last year, he turned a church into 13 uh, condos. This year, he's building uh taking a private home and making five apartments into it. There's equal dwelling in rifle. Final question. Brian, you say your professional experience as a civil engineer has given you a deeper understanding of the complexity and scope of the issues that we face in Garfield County. Give me an example of a complex issue or issues you'd like to tackle that perhaps the current board has failed to address. Well, I will say as, as an engineer, again, we are, we are public servants. We work for towns and municipalities. They are the ones that are providing the funding for these projects and in turn funding for my salary, funding for the, my, my, my company. I've had the opportunity many times of working with towns and municipalities on these complex projects. Currently up in the town of Minturn, over in, in Eagle County, we're building a water storage tank to help the town fight uh, water storage issues and provide a redundant water source. Complex issues because it occurs on public land, on, on town land that is adjacent to public land, have to, have to have to balance wildlife concerns with what the public needs. I think the commissioners in, in the county have similar issues they need to address. I think they come back to where is the right places to build and the wrong places to build and be able to understand that. I think as an engineer, we are regularly required to absorb a variety of different reports and plans from environmental reports to geotechnical to traffic and to synthesize into making decisions. I think that background and foundation will provide me the understanding and the knowledge to be able to make complex decisions as a county commissioner. Tom, 90 seconds. Okay, so, so as a county commissioner, I mean, it, it, there, you do need executive experience. You do need administrative experience. It is about a budget. It is about planning. It is about um, 
it's about human resources. It's about individuals, and and those those that experience is really really important as a um, as a county commissioner. And I had that experience before I became a county commissioner. I sat on the board of Colorado Ski Country USA for almost 20 years. I was a uh, past chair of that. Sat on the Glenwood Springs Chamber Resort Association for eight years, past chair of that. Was on the Bo Sunlight Mountain Board for 20 years as a secretary. So I had a lot of executive experience. I had HR experience. I had accounting experience. I had business experience. And that is that all was enabled me to be a good county commissioner. And so um, I'll leave it at that. Ryan, 30 second rebuttal. It is ironic that the other two commissioners at that, uh, the Garfield County level didn't have executive experience when they came in, right? Mike Sampson and both John Martin, who seemed to have done a fairly decent job, came in not having executive experience. I don't think having an executive experience, quote unquote, as a CEO is a requirement. I certainly have had many of the duties that a, a, an executive would have, running teams to design projects, setting budgets, administering contracts, um, cost control measures. So there's a lot of overlap in my experience that, that, that would, I would say would qualify as executive experience. Well, we've reached the finish line. I want to thank all the candidates and issue representatives for participating in tonight's forum. Our sponsors, Glenwood Springs Post Independent, Glenwood Springs Chamber Resort Association, KMTS. Thank you to the City of Glenwood Springs for the use of City Hall tonight. To our timer, Tara Harmon. Thank you to all the interested voters for your indulgence, your patience, and your attentiveness, uh, both here and uh, virtually. Election day is November 8th. Now we'll go to closing statements, and we'll begin with Tom Jankowski. Okay, I'm committed to making Garfield County a great place to live and, and continue with our quality of life. And that's not just for, uh, for us that are here today, but that's for our children and our grandchildren. I took an oath uh, to protect the health, safety, and welfare of the citizens of Garfield County, and I take that very seriously. I enjoy public service. I can make a difference. I can, I can help people. I can make a difference for the individuals of our county. You know, when I asked, my, Ryan never answered my question when I asked him about what is his background as far as sitting on nonprofit boards, being on a city, city uh, commission, or a committee, he never answered those questions. Or what is his public sector experience? You know, I haven't seen Ryan once in a, in a county commissioner meeting, not, not once to come and see, you know, maybe he's watching them all by Zoom, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Um, in, engineering is an honorable profession, uh, and, and, but it it's, doesn't give you executive experience. And Ryan's not running against John Martin or Mike Sampson, he's running against me. And I have that experience. I, 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 so um, with that, I, I appreciate your support. I'm going to ask for your vote. And thank you for a wonderful evening. Thanks. Ryan, two minutes. Well, I want to thank everybody for attending and watching um, this forum. Again, it's really important that we all hear from all of our candidates. I'd just like to ask you, we have many issues that we face. We've gone over them today, some of them, not all of them. What has the commissioners done in the past to support our future? Affordable housing has been an issue now for decades. Are we prepared for fire? Do we have an evacuation plan set? I think we need to have proactive leadership, people that are going to look to the future and try to, to, to develop and, and bring us and plan for the future conditions. So Tom, Tom mentioned as well about executive experience. Again, as an engineer, I regularly work with city councils in my profession to set jobs, to set budgets, to develop projects, to sit in council chambers and work through these issues. I have plenty of experience on how to run projects and budgets. I think it has provi provided me ample opportunity and ample experience to understand how governments work. I've worked across boundaries with all sorts of folks from the construction and engineering industries, along with the private sector. I think our challenges can be resolved and can be figured out. Again, I think we need a cooperative spirit. We need to reach across the aisle. We need to work with all of our counties and cities 
to make our county the best it possibly can be. I ask for your vote this November to allow, my, allow me to make the decisions for you that we can all move into the future and make a better place for all of us. Thank you very much for your time today. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you for attendance and uh, have a good evening. Yeah, I'm sure. 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 I'm sure